Okay, I'm going to call the meeting to order. Welcome everyone to the 13th meeting of the General Issues Committee for 2013. And members of the public are advised that our meetings are webcast uh, by the City of Hamilton and temporarily archived on the City's website. Other individuals and the media may also be audibly or visually recording this meeting. So Madam Clerk, are there any changes to the agenda? Good morning, Mr. Deputy Mayor, members of the committee. We have several changes to today's agenda. The first is an added ceremonial activity, and there is a report in your packages uh, which can be added as item 5.7, and the, the uh, presentation is respecting Accredited Economic Development Organization, AEDO. It is report PED 13061, added as 5.7 to the consent agenda. There's also an added delegation request for today's meeting from Anna Maria Gagnon respecting the transit fare parity. She would like to speak to the committee today as the item is on the agenda for discussion. And there are added discussion items. The first is the 2013 Hamilton Police Service operating budget. Added as item 8.4, there is no copy distributed related to this item. Um, the next is correspondence from Nancy D. Gregorio, Chair of the Hamilton Police Services Board, respecting the 2013 Hamilton Police Service operating budget. This can be added as item 8.4.1. And report 13-001 of the Accountability and Transparency Subcommittee meeting of March the 5th, 2013, which can be added as item 8.5. And also there has been um, a revised Appendix B to report PED 13063, which is item 7.1 on the agenda today, respecting Highway 56 Interchange and Associated Municipal Roads, Ministry of Transportation, Environmental Study Report, Addendum at Clappison's Corners. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have a motion to approve the agenda is approved. Councillor Farr, seconded by Councillor Pearson. Discussion? All in favour? Opposed? That carries. Thank you. And uh, members of the committee, are there any uh, declarations of interest? Seeing none. And members of the committee, you have before you the minutes of March 20th General Issues Committee meeting. Are there any questions with respect to these minutes? Seeing none, a motion to approve them. Pearson, Clark, all in favor? Carried. Oh, so before proceeding with the business of today's agenda, we have a ceremonial activity, and I'd like to call on Mayor Bertina at this time. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Ferguson. <laughs> On Thursday, February the 7th, I had the opportunity to meet and have breakfast with the International Economic Development Council's site visit team that was in Hamilton to audit our planning and economic development department and how we deliver our economic development services. I was very surprised to learn what a complex and involved undertaking this was and the amount of work put in by our senior staff on this over the past year. So the way it's explained to me is that the Accredited Economic Development Organization designation is equivalent in purpose and status to the ISO accreditation that is used in manufacturing and similar to how General Motors uh, only deals with suppliers that are ISO certified. In the United States, site selectors, industrial realtors, and companies that are expanding look for the AEDO certification in local economic development organizations. So basically it is a quality assurance. So based on the comments I received from the site visit team, I have to tell you how impressed they were with our city's commitment to economic development and the results that have been generated. It started when they walked into City Hall and started taking pictures of our one-stop business center and continued in their meetings with local business, community stakeholders, and our staff. On Friday, March 22nd, the City of Hamilton officially received its Accredited Economic Development Organization status from the International Economic Development Council in Washington, D.C. As you will learn today, we are the first municipal economic development organization in Canada to achieve this and only the 33rd in the world. So we have a video and then uh, Tim McCabe and Neil Everson will uh, fill in uh, some more information on this. So if we could uh, have the video now, Michael Marini. Good morning, Mayor Bertina and the City Council members of Hamilton, Ontario. My name is Jeff Finkel and I serve as the President and CEO of the International Economic Development Council. IEDC has an international membership of city, county and state economic development organizations 
and for Canada's purposes, provincial economic development organizations, as well as public-private partnerships and chambers and universities where economic development is an academic effort. While IEDC provides many services, one of those services that we are most proud of is our accredited economic development organizations program. That program um, basically helps set a standard for what good economic development programs are all about. We do an evaluation of uh, the economic development programs in communities that invite us in, and we decide whether they should receive the AEDO accreditation or not. Hamilton, Ontario's Economic Development Department has undergone that very examination. And we are pleased to say that they are going to become our 34th accredited economic development organization uh, in the world and the second in Canada. The AEDO review team was very impressed with their site visit to Hamilton's office and in the organization's application itself. In particular, the review team spoke very highly of the economic development staff in Hamilton. Uh, the review team's documentation report states all staff members display a sense of commitment to economic development and their client service is exceptional. Staff members are able to articulate the mission and the goals of the organization. Management and support staff have considerable experience uh, in the field of economic development and related fields and all have re relevant professional credentials. In particular, the report praises Tim McCabe, the general manager for planning and economic development, for his leadership and vision when creating the integrated system of economic development and planning that is currently utilized in the city of Hamilton. Likewise, the report speaks highly of the director of economic development, Neil Everson, who serves on IEDC's board of directors. Neil is a 20-year veteran who has significant economic development experience. Both of these gentlemen have attended past IEDC conferences and have served as moderators and speakers for discussion panels. In addition, the review team noted that Hamilton's marketing efforts are world-class. Despite a relatively limited budget, it is clear that the Hamilton Economic Development Division enjoys robust community support and the organization has demonstrated its importance to both the city of Hamilton and the region. Its record of success and its well-prepared plan for the future proves that it is in a strong position to continually positively impact the community it serves. Therefore, IEDC is thrilled to welcome the city of Hamilton's Economic Development Division as its 34th AEDO member. And as a more than twice visitor to Hamilton, Ontario, I would agree with many that it is also a very welcoming community, and I add my personal congratulations. So members of council. Remember once talking to Tony Champion, the great Tiger Cat receiver, when the team was in a kind of a low ebb. <clears throat> I said, Tony, what's the matter with this team? <clears throat> How do we fix it? He said, put the players on the field, let them play. In other words, give these guys the right <clears throat> funding and let them go and do their thing. And that's what we did. And this is what we have. And I'd like to call Tim McCabe and Neil Everson forward now to uh, just comment on this remarkable achievement. Tim and Neil, please. Thanks, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Uh, certainly, I understand you have a very busy agenda today, so we're going to keep our comments short. Um, you know, this this announcement and accreditation is is something I'm so proud of. Uh, I'm proud of it for the department, but I'm proud of it most importantly for the city. And it's not an easy certification, and it's not an easy process. I can tell you that. Fairly complex and comprehensive submission requirements, peer reviews. We had judges from uh, New York and Halifax down for, for three days talking to our stakeholders, talking to um, the mayor and some of our, our business communities. And 
you know, there was various comments that was made in the report. You have some of the reports, but, you know, they, they sent the, the a very, very uh, smart and experienced review committee. And uh, a lot of the questions from the committee were related to our model. And uh, the review team commented uh, on the unique organizational structure that we have. And they commented, uh, I'm very curious about, you know, how economic development people were so successful working working beside planners. How about that, eh? Working beside planners. You know, to allow you to move forward with projects more quickly. And economic uh, development staff that could easily so easily communicate with staff that are involved with permitting. Um, and I tell you, the state side, down in the U.S., it is mainly all arm's length corporations. They, they do not have economic development staff. I don't understand how they can, they can meet their performance targets within the municipalities. Uh, I've always said that you've got to have the tools to make things happen. And the tools that we have here working with economic development are things like engineering and, and capital infrastructure and our real estate services and uh, our incentive programs. And of course, the building permit, you know, the, the pot, pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, all having those in one team and being able to bring them together to make things happen um, is what's made us successful, I believe. Um, getting away from, you know, the traditional economic development uh, uh, departments that are in ivory towers with the gold carpeting and the red carpeting that want to be perceived as removed from the red tape and the bureaucracy of City Hall, it doesn't work. Um, I think we've proven uh, through our, our successes that it does work in here. There was an email uh, to, to Mayor Bertina. You'll like this one. I'll certainly I certainly learned, this is from the review judge that was down, I certainly learned a lot from Hamilton's visit. You and City Council are what makes Tim McCabe and Neil's success possible. I worked for five economic development organizations in my career and have had the chance to review the practices of many more. Never have I seen such a well-coordinated effort to make it easy for the private sector to invest in a community. I can tell you, uh, Mr. Mayor and, and committee, there's 4,600 members of IEDC. 4,600. It's, it's a worldwide organization. And uh, as you saw from the video, we're the 34th uh, organization that has been accredited. And you also heard uh, from Mayor Bertina today we're the first municipally run organization in the world that is accredited. Most, and the other one in Canada, by the way, is Halifax, which is an arm's length development corporation. So uh, it proves our model's worth uh, works, and uh, so many years to, to bring it together, and uh, we've now got the recognition of our, of our peers and organizations across the world. And I want to thank Council for its unwavering support over the last uh, four or five years. So, thank you. Good morning, uh, members of council. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, ask uh, the senior staff in economic development uh, to stand up. Uh, they were a big part of the review team. And uh, if I could for a moment. So just a, a couple of quick remarks uh, to, to add to Tim's. Um, one of the reasons, uh, there's actually three reasons we, we, uh, we want to get the AEDO certification. And the first has to do with uh, an initiative being led by our city manager, which is immigrant entrepreneurs, where you know, we are going to be attempting and endeavoring to attract immigrants to this community uh, to invest and to start corp companies. Uh, the AEDO certification gives us that instant credibility beyond the borders of, of uh, Hamilton and Ontario and Canada. And uh, that is a, a real big factor why we wanted to do this. Just not only to immigrant entrepreneurs, but to corporations and companies that are considering uh, opening operations in this community. Uh, and that really is, as, uh, as the mayor stated, it's an ISO equivalent designation. It, it guarantees quality assurance. Uh, the second one point uh, I want to make is uh, there's a recertification uh, that occurs with this designation. We just don't get it and forget it. Three years from now, we will uh, have to go, in 2016, we will have to go through the certification. Much scaled down version, but it's to make sure that we are uh, meeting current world standards in regards to economic development. And the last uh, point I want to make is that um, the IEDC has an annual conference every year. And during that conference, um, for the AEDO uh, um, 
certified com communities, so there's 34 of us, there's a three-hour session uh, that only AEDO members can attend. And what's important about that is uh, it's a, an exchange of best practices and uh, what works and what's not working in the field of economic development. And as an AEDO, AEDO member, we now have access to that. So again, we can just uh, use this to make our model even better. And uh, as, uh, as one of the other, uh, Tim didn't read it, one of the other emails we had was uh, we were very fortunate to have council support. And uh, you know, they were hoping that this would continue, and, and I'm sure it will, and we'll continue to do our best for you. Thank you. It also goes to show you what three men and eight women can accomplish when they put their minds to it. <laughs> Folks, um, this is really such an important uh, thing for the city of Hamilton, and I know that uh, in the previous campaign there, there were many suggestions that we should go to the ivory tower arm's length uh, approach, and, and I felt that, and obviously council did too, that we had the people in place, all we had to do was give them resources and turn them loose and the outcome. So congratulations and thank you very much. Thanks very much, Bob, and congratulations to Tim Neal and the rest of the team. I, I know when I ran a private sector company, I took it through an ISO certification and it was tough. And you're subject to regular audits to make sure that you're still in compliance. So, but that initial certification was extremely difficult and uh, so I can personally understand what you went through to get this, and congratulations again. Members of the committee, you have before you a delegation request from the members of the Board of Directors of the Canadian Ballet Youth Assemble, and uh, they would like to come to a future meeting. So can I have a motion moved by Partridge, seconded by Powers? Sure, absolutely. Could I suggest that they be accommodated at the April 17th GIC meeting, please? That okay, Madam Clerk? Okay. So we move in for a future uh, presentation at the April 17th meeting. Councillor uh, McCaddy. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I, I think that's it's supportable. I, I just wanted to ask about the, uh, just the clarification on the HECFI situation. Because uh, I understand there's, there's a lawsuit uh, that HECFI has with the organization. And I, we always need to be careful we don't put ourselves in a position where we're, uh, we're asking questions that may be difficult later on, those kinds of things. So maybe just a, a clarification uh, before, we, uh, before we vote, or maybe uh, which may lead to simply going ahead with the, uh, the deputation, uh, but maybe with some uh, provisos. OK. Uh, Janice, are you aware of this? Is it something we need to be cognizant of in order to bring a delegation in? Um, I'm, I think it's, it's a good point. What is going on is that the city um, is pursuing a debt collection against this organization, which was a debt incurred to HECFI, um, and the um, quantum of that is $48,500. I don't know whether one suggestion might be that in advance of the deputation, perhaps uh, this organization would like to make contact with staff to see if there's something that can be sorted through in advance of the deputation. And uh, otherwise, uh, depending on what they intend to be uh, saying at the deputation, uh, right. govern hey, ourselves accordingly. Mr. Mayor, I think that's probably good guidance. Uh, so I, I think we'll just uh, have to maybe be updated in some way ahead of the deputation so we don't uh, get into some questions that might uh, uh, get us in a bit of a jackpot. Thanks. Councilor Powers, I don't know you want to amend your motion then that the, uh, the delegation speak to a legal counsel before they come, but uh, it's up to you. I believe our solicitor will just take the lead on that, but there was a, uh, a document provided to all members of council, a multiple page document that was provided to us with a chronological, so I mean, so there's, there's nothing new, so I, I would suggest that our, uh, our, our chief solicitor and that uh, work them to ensure that the, uh, the appropriate discussions take place and if some of them require in camera, so be it. Okay, so we have a motion then to invite them to the April 17th GIC and our city solicitor can speak to them and maybe we can review some of those issues that are gender review then before it comes to the meeting. Okay, so here's the motion to duly moved and seconded. All in favor? Carried. Opposed? That's carried. And the second one is. Uh, uh, a request for a delegation from Anna Maria Gagno respecting transit fare parity. So moved by 
Councillor Marula, seconded by Collins. All in favor? And um, since you approved that delegation, she wants to come today, so I need a motion to waive the rules to permit her to come today. Moved by Duvall, seconded by Jackson. All in favor? Carried. Carry. Okay, hey, members of committee, you have before you consent items 5.1 to 5.7. Are there any items you wish to have uh, moved to discussion agenda? Madam Clerk. Through the chair, I understand that item 5.5 has an amendment that staff wish to advise the committee, please. So we need to have uh, a short, or somebody wants to speak to it, uh, Mr. McCabe. So, Mr. Deputy Mayor, it's, a, it's just a typo correction on 5.5a. The legal description is not uh, 62R15721, it's 15712. So if you could just, if you uh, could acknowledge, just that, in, Madam Kirk, acknowledge that and put in the uh, corrections. Okay, so is there any items committee would like to have moved to discussion items? Councillor Collins. I have six. Any others? Councillor Clark? Councillor Clark, you have uh, something you'd like to say? You had your hand up. Yes. I wanted to get an update from our legal side. Requests have been made prior to our new team. Regards to uh, restrictions of, of grants and loans to individuals who uh, were found to be convicted of different criminal acts and things along that line. Staff are to come back with different alternatives and options available to council. I know through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, but that uh, our legal counsel is new, but I don't want to lose sight of that request either. So, Neil, do you want to comment on that? Janice? You uh, through through the chair um, we that is in the works I'm aware of that and I appreciate the uh, that being brought to my attention in case I wasn't but uh, uh, the city manager had made me aware of that and I am working on that with my staff and we will be bringing something forward a little later this spring that's fine that's thank you sir thank okay. you thank you anything else if not I need a motion then to approve items 5.1 through 5.5 and 5.7 with 5.6 moved to discussion Moved by Councillor Farr, seconded by Councillor Johnson. Discussion? All in favor? Carried. Okay, public hearings and delegations. Uh, the first delegation, I would like to now call on Dave Barnett to approach the podium to give his presentation. You have um, welcome, and you have five minutes. Thank you. This is actually my evening time, being a work uh, night worker. That's uh, usually well into sleep, so hopefully, I can make sense of this. Uh, I've been trying to get this uh, information heard since uh, March of '09. I tried to put in delegation requests, and I had a response back from uh, Mary Gallagher saying it should be dealt with with the police services board and the library board. And this would be regarding the bullying behavior that goes on in the city, and I've experienced plenty of it. I've seen a lot of it, too. Uh, I got a re, um, response back from, um, I've been through three chiefs of police, uh, Robertson, uh, Mullen, and uh, DeCare. And the latest response from uh, DeCare was, uh, you've been advised on several occasions, there's nothing further the police service is going to do. I assistant uh, Taylor Beckett and I think we all know what happened there uh, I might add that Terry says there's nothing he can do as well library board I got a letter from uh, Jennifer Gottry who basically said the same thing that your request to make a present presentation the library board has been denied I get letters from city solicitors saying don't call us anymore or don't call city staff anymore regarding the problems but I've seen too much of it. Uh, three days at the end of February, I saw a young girl pulling the chain of the dog that she was 
dragging along so hard and yelling at it on Maine and Sherman to the point I thought she was going to break the dog's neck. The next day, I see a young boy, maybe 10, uh, got his, another young boy in a headlock, maybe 7, <clears throat> and he walks by me. He says, can you slap this kid for me? The next day after that, I see a, a young girl, maybe 8 years old, down at Maine and Wellington, and her mother's just, what is wrong with you? She just plunks down on the sidewalk in distress. I cross the light on the yellow. She runs across, and me. her mother, of course, is still flipping out. Just today, getting off the bus, I saw an old lady in a walker. I've heard bus drivers say, sit down until the bus is, is finished moving before you get up. Well, she does this, notifies the driver, I'm getting off, I guess he didn't hear him, and the people started filing on at Jackson Square, and he's like, well, I guess all you people have to get off. So he was rude to her. This goes on, it doesn't, a week doesn't go by when I see this happening. So there's certain elements of the city that you guys don't like. And understandably, because there's the influx of the undesirables, as the nutters, the circus freaks, as I've heard the locals call them, I refer to them affectionately as Adam's family. People are a little bit odd, but most of them are very friendly. But there's too many of them. You drag in the problems from all over the region, you get them dumped here, and no wonder why people get all bent out of shape. There's one, there was an uh, article in the, um, the re review, I mean, the view rants, about uh, this, this girl says, I live on Barton, and uh, there's this crazy guy who lives near. He comes up and he talks to me about God knows what. Uh, they're all around us. I don't want to deal with this stuff anymore. It's, it's, and, this, and he got an article in The Spectator from a CEO of a company here, and he's talking about how golfers came into town, and they said that uh, this is the worst hotel on tour, the service is despicable. So, and, the, and they had the scariest looking degenerates downtown, this was the CEO talking about this, and brain dead zombies kind of thing. So the problem is, you get them in the mental health system, you drug them into, into being zombies, they're poor as can be because the group homes take almost 90% of the government checks, so they're downtown begging. And uh, it looks like they're not as off in downtown. It looks like the sweep, the action team has swept the undesirables uh, under the rug, God knows where. But the problem is, like I say, there's too many of them. I can understand people getting bent out of shape because there's too many. The, the ratio is too high. But you can't. The local people you, that you're having problems with the girls uh, in the Corktown, opening up a, a spot down there, the just transfer them all over the city is not the answer. The, this, the ratio is way too high. You have to stop the city as a dumping ground. You have to uh, keep bringing the other people's problems into the city where they, where they come here. And I've come from Niagara Falls, a hospitality town originally. And to come here, I can't believe what goes on, the treatment that I get and I've seen other people get. Now the atrocities that uh, the atrocities that go on at the uh, Hamilton Psych facility have to be investigated. There's too much uh, bullying going on there. It's nothing more than a boot camp. They falsify records. They treat people against the law by the, what the treatment they're doing, and then you send them out in the community, and all they are is frustrated. So uh, the hostility is like the movie Crash. Uh, the one with uh, Sandra Bullock as opposed to the, uh, the sex film by Cronenberg. But um, the, the problem is, is that there's the open hostility between all the groups and it creates a lot of friction and it has to, the only way I can see it being resolved is to stop bringing uh, the rest of the, the region's uh, problems into your city and then just treat them badly because there's so many of them because you can't tolerate them. I can understand that, but you have to stop dragging them in. And that hospital needs to be shut down. It needs to be investigated. There has to be a complete investigation of the corruption that goes on up there and the treatment that the patients experience. And I've got documents to prove it. Okay. Thanks. I give you a little latitude, a little more time. We have some questions. Would you stay at the podium, please? Councilor Clark. to the psychiatric hospital that... Well, several times of being thrown in seclusion without grounds contrary to their policies and fabricating uh, reports. And then when I requested reports to even try to get access to these reports, it's very difficult. But when they did, they've changed the reports after the fact. I was thrown in seclusion, literally almost broke my neck. 
I could get no uh, medical attention there. And uh, I was also in seclusion. They love to throw you in over the weekend because they can hold you for three days because there's no doctor to assess you. I was held in there because of my, uh, my health conditions or my food requirements. I was held in there without food and water for three days. That's bad. Thank you. Okay, thanks for coming right, out today. I hope there'd be more. Okay. No, I see no more, so thank you. A motion to uh, receive the presentation. Moved by uh, Councillor Johnson, seconded by Councillor Pearson. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. I'd now like to call upon Anna Maria uh, Gagno to approach the podium to provide her presentation respecting transit fare parity. And uh, I would remind the committee that this is on item 7.2 of today's agenda. So is uh, Anna Maria here? Here we are. So, Anna Maria, the podium is yours, and uh, you have five minutes. Okay, I'm here for the fight for people who are on disability. Um, on Monday, my boyfriend, he's a Parkinson's disease, he was demanded to pay a fare to get on the bus. And to see all these people with advice, there's some people that don't need it, it's called fraud. And my idea is to get the doctors to do a document, because my father is blind, he got a, a little photo stamped to why he needs the bus because he's blind, an ID card. So if we get all these disability to get an ID card with the picture, just think of the money and the cost of paying for those people that can't afford the trip of a bus. So my idea is to catch these fraud and charge them by using a device which they don't need. I see it all the time. But on Monday, to being disc discriminated by someone with a device one allowed to be on the bus because she demanded money a fare to be to be put on the bus and also she didn't allow him to park the scooter on the bus so i'm here for everybody who are just dis a disability that needs device they shouldn't be paying a fare for the people who are fighting so my idea if the, if the doctors can do a document and send it out to the uh, government, get a picture ID, why they need to go on the bus. And this will happen because these people who are fighting, they're not able to get that. The people who are disability can get that. Because just think, the poverty is so low and all these doctor's appointments, it's going to cost all you guys money to pay for their bus fare or a bus pass because they cannot afford the bus. So my idea is it's like to catch the fraud. I see it. I'm on the bus. I mean, I have a cell phone. I use my cell phone for the HSR and explain what the buses are, the bus people are doing. It's, they're pretty rude and discriminating against the people with disability. So I fight for them. And to me, a document should be placed from a doctor, get a photo idea, why these people need the bus, not having to spend a lot of money and the cost of a bus fare for them. So that's my input. So. For the presentation, anybody have any questions? Councillor Pearson. Thank you for the information. I just want to ask the question for, you mentioned your boyfriend, they, he wasn't allowed to take his scooter on the bus. Could you just clarify that? Well, he wasn't allowed to go on until he paid the fare. And I explained to the bus driver, because I read a lot, it's canceled till June. And she told me she was advised on Monday that her boss told everybody needs to pay the fare. But he came up to see me and he didn't have to pay. So I tried fighting for him, but a, a person, a bypass, I didn't have the change, but somebody on the bus gave him the money just to get on the bus. So I told her, I wrote the number, 2012 and I phoned HSRs, they didn't accept me, and I says, you have to accept me, because I, I'm involved with the community of the uh, Coalition Center of Human Rights. So when I see this, people are discriminating the disability to what they have. Even when you go on the bus, the attitude of people, you hear them, they don't belong on the bus. Well, they do, you know, so. Thank you for the clarification. Yeah. Councillor Whitehead. Oh, hold on, Anne Maria. There's another question. <laughs> Hi, Anne Maria. Appreciate your presentation. Uh, it's clear that uh, a lot of people with disabilities are disproportionately uh, 
have financial challenges, no question about that. But there are people with disabilities that have good and strong financial means. Mm -hmm. uh, so are you suggesting that the free transit should be for every dis person with disability or there should be a combination of the medical uh, documentation uh, with a means test, meaning to determine what their financial capabilities are? Well, I'm looking at if you get a document written by doctors, why do they need the bus pass or the free pass to get on the bus? And do a picture idea with a stamp and it shows why they need the bus. And then you got the people who have the money are buying device, the scooter, and when they get off, you can see their normal legs. So they can get a document from a doctor. They're buying these. They go to the store, you know. So if you ride the bus, you can see the attitude of people and discriminating the bus, the bus people. And then when somebody gets on the bus, like a scooter, they're lazy to put the ramp down. They'll just t uh, take off. So my, my suggestion, get a document from the doctor, go to GO station, do a photo ID, stamp it, and why they need it. Like Parkinson's disease, any device or legs, I mean, people's legs don't work anymore. You know, and it's not right discriminating them when you got people who have the money or buying these devices just to get on for free. So you want to have it who's fraudy and who's needy. Get the documents set from the doctors, picture ID, stamp. That's what my dad has, and he writes the bus. I, and he I, shows the ID. And we, I, I understand that uh, on the disability side. Yeah. What I'm saying is uh, there, are, uh, there are some people, and I already talked with disproportionately uh, people with disabilities uh, have financial challenges, but certainly there are uh, people with disabilities that make good money. But how do you know? Well, because you do a means test. And if, if, if they make $80,000 a year, should taxpayers be subsidizing their bus ride? Well, if they're making that kind of money, that means they're working, right? There's people right. who cannot work. People who... Same people that aren't working with disabilities. Fair enough. I just wanted to get clarification. Yeah. Appreciate so it. So people who are working can't afford it, but people who can't, what do you do? You have to pay the cost. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank oh. you. Okay, I see no more questions. I motion to receive the presentation. Pearson Johnson, all in favor? Carry. So members of the committee, we're now on to item 7.1, which is a staff presentation. <laughs> Excuse me. And I will call on uh, Diane Morelli to approach the podium to provide the presentation. And uh, welcome to GIC, and, and so the podium is yours, and you can proceed with the presentation. Okay. Good morning, Chair and members of Council. Thank you for having us here today. I will be providing a brief overview of the Highway 5 and 6 interchange addendum and the City of Hamilton's history with this MTO project. Uh, prior to the overview, I would first like to introduce the project team that is here with us today. From the City of Hamilton, we have Sally Young Lee and Tanya McKenna. And from MTO, we have Bill Kung, Martin Mischleck, and Chris Barber. And from IBI, we have Stephen Chu and Don Drackley, who is part of the project consulting team. Don will be providing the overall presentation today on behalf of MTO. Um, and now I'm just going to go quickly over um, the City of Hamilton's history on this project. 
Back in 2003, MTO completed a transportation environmental study report for the Highway 5 and 6 interchange, which is located in the Waterdown Flamborough area. At the time, MTO received all appropriate environmental assessment clearances from the Ministry of Environment. Following the environmental assessment approvals, the City of Hamilton and MTO entered into a cost-sharing agreement for the interchange. The cost-sharing agreement was approved by Council on April 23, 2008. The agreement can be summarized into two main components. The first is the interchange. All related costs for the interchange will be shared at a 75-25% split between MTO and the City, with the MTO's share at 75% and the City of Hamilton's share at 25%. However, all construction costs to the city for the interchange will be capped at 7.5 million. And it is important to note that the construction costs for the interchange uh, will also include all the utility relocates within this intersection. The second component is the municipal roads. All costs related to providing the necessary municipal roads to facilitate this interchange will also be split at 75-25%, with MTO at 75 and the city at 25%. Following the signing of the cost-sharing agreement between MTO and the City of Hamilton, MTO identified the need to update key aspects of the 2003 interchange design. Since 2009, City of Hamilton staff from various sections and departments have been working with MTO on the addendum work that is going to be presented to you here today. Under the environmental assessment process, MTO is the proponent and this is the transportation uh, for this transportation project and the City of Hamilton is a key stakeholder. I will now turn it over to Don so he can go into the details of the project, including why the addendum work is needed. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne. Don, can you get as close as you can to the microphone, pull it right down to you so we can hear. Yes, thank you, Deputy Mayor, members of the committee. I'm Don Drackley. I'm a transportation consultant with IBI Group, and I'm going to take you through a hopefully brief presentation uh, on the, the background and the status of this project. It involves a study area that uh, is in the immediate vicinity of the Highway 5 and 6 intersection, commonly called Clappison's Corners. It extends from Highway 6 just at the Niagara Escarpment to a point north of Parkside Drive, about, and so that's a length of about uh, three kilometres, and it extends about one kilometre each side of Highway 6 on Highway 5 and, and Dundas Street. The background, as, as uh, Diana just mentioned, the Ministry of Transportation uh, got an environmental assessment approval to build this interchange back in 2003. Um, the point, or the purpose is to build a new interchange to replace the at-grade intersection and to meet uh, uh, transportation demands that are growing significantly and will continue to grow over the next 20 years. It's important to note that that 2003 environmental assessment approval did not include any municipal roads. So what we're doing now is uh, we are conducting and have come just about completed a, an addendum to that environmental assessment to add some changes to the design of the inter interchange, um, to include changes to the municipal road system, and to add a commuter parking lot to the project, which hadn't been considered in 2003. In terms of the study area, it's also important to note that north of Highway 5 and Dundas Street, that area is designated as part of the Greenbelt Plan. So it's protected countryside, so it's going to have limited development and growth in the future. To the south of Highway 5 and Dundas Street, it, that part is uh, located within the Niagara Escarpment Plan. And although a lot of it is protected as a natural area, there is some urban development potential to the south of the, the Highway 5 and 6 intersection. This drawing here shows the extent of the changes that are now part of the addendum. So every red line you see there is, is, a, is a road section or a highway section that had not been considered as part of the 2003 environmental assessment or is now being changed. The main change with Highway 6 is, is that it, an additional lane in each direction has to be added to accommodate uh, expected traffic growth to 2031. The reason being that the previous environmental assessment that was approved in 2003 only forecasted to 2021. So we have 10 more years of traffic growth that have to be accommodated. But as you see from this drawing, a lot of the project involves an environmental assessment for changes to municipal roads. As Diana mentioned, the cost split is 7525 MTO in City of Hamilton. Um, 
The total cost of the project for the interchange is about $25 million to the city and $7.5 million to the to, excuse me, to MTO and $7.5 million to the city. For the municipal roads, it's about $2.5 million to MTO and about a million to the city. Now, it's important to note that with the agreement between the city and the Ministry of Transportation, the city's contribution to the cost of constructing the interchange is capped at $7.5 million. This does not include property acquisition. The city is going to be sharing in 25% of the property acquisition required to build the project. Now, the number one question that we've gotten throughout this project is when it's going to be built. And I can report that the Highway 5 and 6 interchange is not within the Ministry of Transportation's provincial five-year capital budget. So we can't tell you when it's going to be built. However, we can say that that budget is reviewed annually. And so we don't know what changes may, may be there in the future. A quick cross-section showing this is a, a major piece of highway engineering. Uh, three lanes northbound with a big center median uh, separating it from two lanes southbound. It's eventually designed for a third lane southbound, probably within the 20-year horizon of the project. In terms of the changes that are required to the highway, and especially your municipal roads, I'm just going to take you through this by quadrant. So in the southwest quadrant of the study area, we first of all have the location of the uh, Tim Hortons and Petro Canada and Wendy's commercial operation. And I'm going to show you in a minute how they're going to be served. But the main change here is, is that Innovation Drive that you see is going to have to be extended with a new road called Street A up to intersect with uh, Highway 5. And that will be a signalized intersection. The existing intersection of South Drive and Highway 5 is going to be changed to a right-in, right-out. And there will be a signalized intersection at the southbound off-ramp from Highway 6 onto Highway 5. So just to look at this a little closer, this is the commercial area in the southwest quadrant. And it will be served by traffic being able to, uh, westbound traffic on Highway 5 being able to, excuse me, eastbound traffic on Highway 5 being able to turn into a, a cul-de-sac to serve the commercial area. Uh, westbound traffic and traffic going northbound on Highway 6 would be able to make a left turn into the commercial area. Southbound traffic on Highway 6 will be able to take a, a direct route right across highway, highway 5 into the commercial area. But leaving the commercial area, the only way out will be a right turn, and that's right turn only on green. So that's the, uh, a major change for how that intersection is going to operate. Further up the road in the, in the north uh, west quadrant north of Boers Creek, the major change there is that there's going to be a center median down the middle of Highway uh, 6 so that um, left, uh, northbound left turning traffic will not be able to make that maneuver anymore. What that traffic will have to do is travel northbound to Parkside Drive, make a left turn into a cul-de-sac as you see in the red line here, turn around in the cul-de-sac, make a right turn out and then access um, uh, Woodsworth uh, drive. Garwood, the Garwood Avenue intersection on the left side of the plan here is going to have to be closed. So this is a, um, a significant change for this area, but it's still a safe change, we believe, and it, it, it has the capability of operating properly. South of Boers Creek, there has to be some additional, some new additional municipal roads built. First off, North Wentworth Drive, which currently uh, serves the uh, the the uh, um, Wentworth Community Centre is going to have to be closed and all of the access that's currently provided to the businesses directly onto Highway 5 in that location are going to now be accessed by a new road that's built around to the back. And then that road will also continue to serve um, the new recreation centre as well as uh, rear access to a couple of the businesses that are located on the west side of Highway 6. In the northeast quadrant, the main change there is the addition of the carpool lot. We feel that's the best location for the carpool lot based on, on property and traffic and safety and accessibility. The lot is for at least 100 cars. Uh, we've consulted with Hamilton Street Railway and Metrolinx, and they concur with this location. And it's also flexible enough to, uh, to locate um, local and regional bus service in the future. In the southeast quadrant, the main change there is there will be a new road that will intersect with Dundas Street uh, at a signalized intersection, and it will extend down and become a new way of accessing three 
residential properties that are located on the escarpment edge, as well as Liberty Engineering. And the existing access to Liberty Engineering, which is a right in, right out off of Highway 6, has to be closed. And we've been in extensive discussions with Liberty Engineering and those three property owners, and we feel that this is the best way of accommodating their needs. Now, just a couple of uh, pictures here. This is what it would look like in a rendering looking northbound. Um, you can see on the uh, right side, Liberty Engineering. You can see the off-ramp from Highway 6 northbound onto Dundas Street. Uh, the building with the little red roof on it is the Petro-Canada operation. And it's a very, a very significant change from, of course, the at-grade intersection that's there today. This is what it would look like looking eastbound along Dundas Street. Uh, this is actually Highway 6. Um, towards the, the business park, towards approaching the, the highway from the west. This is what it would look like on Highway 5, looking west across the, the new interchange. A much different situation, as I said, than what's there today. And this is what it would look like in the opposite direction. This is on Highway 6, looking eastbound towards, uh, excuse me, Highway 5 looking eastbound, eastbound towards Highway 6, and once again, the building with the red roof on it is the Petro-Canada. Now, property acquisition. MTO has already acquired some property for the interchange. Um, MTO's objective all along and continues to be that they will entertain further advanced pur purchases of property on a willing buyer, willing seller basis. So all property owners have to do is contact the ministry and they'll begin the discussions and negotiations for property acquisition. The ministry's property staff also remain available uh, and have all throughout the, the one and a half years of this project to address the property owner's needs and, uh, and negotiations. Um, now the acquisition of property for the municipal roads, we believe that that can start to take place as soon as this uh, environmental assessment addendum is filed and completed, which we are hoping to be next month. The consultation that's been conducted to date has been extensive. We had a very well attended public information center last year in June. Uh, we've held extensive meetings with stakeholder groups, including residential and business property owners, and in some cases, their legal representatives, the conservation authorities, the Niagara Escarpment Commission, utility companies, and of course municipal staff from Hamilton, Burlington, and Halton Region. Uh, First Nations have all also been contacted, as is required through the environmental assessment process. And what we have done is responded uh, as best we can to anybody who provided comments on this project and requested information back. There will be one further public consultation event uh, presumably next year as part of the detailed design to explain the detailed design to people, but we don't have a date for that right now. So in conclusion, what staff has recommended is that the committee um, uh, support this uh, environmental assessment addendum and that we then move on to the next steps, which is to, uh, as I said, be prepared to file or to put out a notice of, of environmental assessment completion next month. Um, there will be a 30-day minimum public review period. There will be opportunities for people to appeal through a, a, what's called a, 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 the appeal process that the Ministry of the Environment allows. But in the end, the, the design of the road, the preliminary design is now completed. Um, the, and pending approval of this environmental assessment, hopefully next month, then we expect that the uh, detailed design of the interchange and the municipal roads will be completed in the spring and the summer of next year. And as I said, the question of when it'll actually be built remains to be determined by the ministry. Thank you. Thank you, Don. And so just so I'm clear, slide 21 is a resolution you want council to approve? Yes. Okay, so just leave that up on the screen then yeah. for now. That would be great. And I have Councillor Wade Ed. Thank you. Uh, I, I think the first question I have is, um, what is the geographic scope drives the necessity to do what you're doing. So I need to understand, uh, is this the traffic volumes that you're accommodating, is it specifically Hamiltonians you're accommodating, or is this a much greater scope that you're accommodating? It is a greater scope than just Hamilton. Certainly Highway 6 is a major provincial connection corridor right from 401 down to the Hamilton area. 
and similarly Highway 5 and, and Dundas Street in your own jurisdiction are, are also contributing a lot of traffic to this intersection. Um, so yes, I would have to say, and our traffic analysis, analysis was done on a, in a regional basis to determine how much traffic is going to grow at that intersection. Geographically in that scope where predominantly the traffic is uh, coming from, are they making any contributions uh, uh, citywide for the, the uh, development of this interchange and these changes? Not to my knowledge. Um, the money that is being asked from the city in the, in the context of the contribution, is that specifically for the uh, the, the, the local and regional road uh, network, or is that actually going directly into the interchange? There is a portion of it that goes into the interchange, and then the rest of it is, the, is for your municipal roads. Help me understand how uh, the property taxpayers should be contributing to a, uh, a provincial highway system. Um, I would have to refer that back to the arrangements that were made between the Ministry of Transportation and the City of Hamilton. Maybe it's a better question to ask. Uh, yeah, I'm going to Mike Segar, could you? I think this is a previous agreement, but uh, I'll let you con. Through you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, this project is contained there in our 2009 DC background study. It's reflected as, as 100 percent growth related development funded. Uh, the project is uh, budgeted at $25 million, 50% residential and 50% non-residential split. So again, 100% DC funded at $25 million, total project cost split equally between residential and non-residential. So um, the question I asked earlier, uh, Michael, is that uh, the scope of the, what's driving the necessity for this change is not just Hamilton oriented. So, uh, and I also asked the question whether other uh, municipalities are making contribution, and I, t I was told basically no. So how would we enter into an agreement that we uh, have to uh, cover a significant, uh, or at least a significant amount of dollars, but no one else is making that contribution? For you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, uh, my previous reference to the $25 million is the city's contribution, the city's projected cost, the overall project far exceeds the $25 million. So there is a significant contribution through uh, MTO and through the province. And you'll see on page 4 of 16, the estimate uh, is uh, the total at uh, $74.6 million, $18 million from the city, and $56.5 million through MTO from the province. Didn't I also see, Michael, in the report that there's a 7525 agreement that was struck in 2008? So through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, the numbers I just referenced relate to that 75-25% split. Okay. I appreciate it. It's not much different than the, uh, I think, the funding we had for the Red Hill Expressway, which is now a provincial highway, but where property taxpayers are paying for the life cycle costs and the maintenance. So that would drive the next question. Who will be maintaining uh, this particular uh, capital expense on the long term? Has the city got any role in, uh, in operating uh, our maintenance or life cycle cost once this is built? I, I don't believe that the city has a maintenance responsibility for the highway. You certainly will have a maintenance responsibility for the, your own municipal roads. How about the life cycle cost, maintenance cost? I'd have to defer that to MTO. Maybe Michael can tell me, is that part of the agreement that we are now locked in uh, uh, into perpetuity on the uh, uh, life cycle cost of this particular interchange? Currently not part of uh, any agreement. I'm, I'm assuming for the municipal roads, the municipality would take responsibility for that because, uh, you know, the ministry would not want to do the maintenance and long-term care of those facilities. Um, it, but it's, it's currently not part of the discussions we've had, and it's not part of the agreement that we put together. Yeah, we had a, big, a bit of a giggle here uh, when we saw that, uh, as opposed to having people take a left turn, uh, you're pushing them into a uh, into a cul-de-sac, and they have to turn around and then backtrack to make a left turn. Is that the new best practice uh, for transportation networks? Um, it is. It it is a solution specifically for that location. The reason being that we are not certain about what the future 
of that residential cluster is on the west side of Highway 6. And therefore, we've, we've tried to create a solution to allow them maximum access, albeit it, what looks like in a bit of a roundabout way, but still safe uh, access until such time, over time, that that area changes. And we expect that over time it will change because of the, you know, the, the access restrictions and the, the, just the environment of living beside a six-lane highway. So is MTO exercise that strategy, or, or there's a living example of that anywhere in Ontario? I'm not familiar with another example in the province for, for that type of a solution. It's, it's what Don said. It's, you need to get rid up to the microphone. Sorry, I'm not familiar with any other type of solution we've had for that. I mean, we've put in cul-de-sacs for municipal roads. We've done it on 406 and other areas. But, um, you know, we're, we're trying to find the best solution for the local residents in that area. And we're having those conversations are a property office with the residents and through our PICs to get their input in terms of the best way to satisfy them. There, you know, as Don said, eventually this could become a controlled access highway and the highway is, is getting extended further and further north, right? So the ministry has to sort of look towards the future in, at this location, so. I understand, um, and we had a meeting not very long ago, I think with the MTO, and we talked about uh, the 401 connection on Highway 6 and the fact that it goes down to, I think it's two lanes to, I don't know what that town is, Morrison or whatever it is. Uh, and uh, so I'm trying to understand, you widen, you expand, you accommodate at one end of this highway just to narrow it down to a two lane uh, uh, highway at the other end. Uh, so just trying to understand uh, how this, is this working concurrently? Are you doing something at the other end? Because it doesn't make a lot of sense to me that you would expand uh, greater capacity on one side of Highway 6 when it bottlenecks at the other side. We've had that question asked to us before. Uh, the answer is, is that the Ministry of Transportation is looking at the future of Highway 6 right from the 401 down to the 403. Uh, what we're dealing with right now is one specific, albeit complicated, uh, location along that highway. But the, the future of the highway all the way up to the 401 is being studied by the ministry. Okay, and uh, are you looking for this recommendation to be passed today? Yes. This is the first time we've seen it. Thank you. Councillor Partridge. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I have been, just for my colleagues' uh, edification around the table, I've been involved in, uh, in this since 2010, actually prior to the election with residents who were looking at it. But we have had uh, a couple of meetings. We've had meetings with some of the businesses there. And uh, this is a massive project, as you can see. It's, um, uh, it's just literally going to blow up that whole area of water down which, by the way, is where all the development is happening and all the new homes are happening. Parkside Drive will be under construction. Um, the new bypass will be built within the next 10 years, and we're going to have this. So my question, gentlemen, when the, uh, when the interchange is under construction, where will the traffic go? I'm assuming there's going to be lane closures, there's going to be a reduction. Where will the traffic go? Because it is, um, I don't know what the counts are now. I think they're around 70,000 70, per day. And perhaps you could just clarify that in, in part of your answer as well. Thank you. Well, um, I'll start off and answer. And if, if MTO or our project manager can add to it, that would be appreciated. But uh, in order to build something like this, one of the first things you have to have is a detour plan. That, that plan is prepared as part of the detailed design. That plan will describe, and in working with the city and the other involved municipalities, that plan will describe how traffic is going to operate in there, that area. But normally speaking, detour plans are created so that the flow of traffic can be maintained. It's just maintained in different ways. And that access to property is maintained, but in different ways. And the capacity right now, what is the traffic count for that area? The daily traffic volumes on that road are depending on the location between 20 and 30,000 vehicles a day. It's very high. I'm just talking about Highway 6 here. I thought it was much higher than that, actually. 42,000 at the bottom. Is it? Yeah, I was going to say, when they did the, the interchange at uh, York, which is just uh, south of Clapison, it was around 42 to 45,000. 
I so I would suggest that the, uh, the figure would be much higher up at the five and six interchange. And so that, you know, I mean, that's part of what, what concerns the residents and, con and certainly concerns me is in doing this detour plan, I don't know where the heck they're going to be detoured to because the other roads are also going to be under construction. And um, there are no other major arteries to accommodate, uh, particularly the truck traffic, which huge tandem trucks and transport trucks, there's thousands upon thousands of them. At any given time when you sit at that, in at that intersection, you can count 30 or 40 of them just going through one light. So um, when, when will you be doing that detour plan is my question. As I said, the detour plan is normally conducted as part of the detailed design and that'll be next year. Okay. Um, now I understand we've taught, you've mentioned in here when your, uh, your public information centers uh, were held. And I can tell you that uh, certainly at the last one, uh, many residents were extremely upset. Um, our staff did as best a job as they could uh, talking to the residents, but they seemed uh, to be in the dark. And for, for many of them, this was the first time that they had heard about any of the details. So I'm concerned that there's only one more public information center planned. Um, and uh, can you just confirm again when you think that's going to be? Because I think sooner is better than later. Well, the right now we're expecting that that would be held, as I said, during the detailed design exercise so we can explain to people exactly what, what it will be, how it will be built, like you said, what the tra alternative tra traffic arrangements are. And that right now is expected to be next spring. So that's spring of 2014. In terms of the, the, the dialogue with the public, We've been actually dealing with people m much more through informal one-on-one -on -one contacts than we have through the, the public information center. So we, I think we've gotten the message out. I know we've gotten the message out to all of the interested parties that all they have to do is pick up the phone or send an email and they will be able to contact our team and we'll be able to address whatever they need to be addressed. And you do have that contact information because I would certainly appreciate it in our office so that when we get the calls. I could make that arrangement. It's a thick document, but I could get it. Don't want the document. All I want is the name and the phone number it's, and the email. That's it's all I need. It's still a thick document. <laughs> nope, that's all I need just to be able to say, here's who you talk to. I can arrange that. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, one, of the, one of the areas that, that I hear... Go, uh, go ahead, Diana. Uh, we have the project on our website with all of MTO's contact information, so we'll send that to you as well. It's just a, a easier direct uh, access to it. Thank you, Diana. With due respect, I don't even want to go down the road of our website. That's a whole separate discussion. <laughs> you have one? So don't start. So <laughs> through you, Jer, if you could get me that information for the contact, that would, that would be terrific. And I, and I guess the other question I have is when you hold the Public Information Centre, are you informing people of what their rights are when it comes to the expropriation process? Yes, that was one of the main pieces of information that was presented at the, uh, at the PIC, was not only their rights under the Expropriation Act, but also the process that the Ministry of Transportation uses to acquire property. We had a lot of discussion about that that day, and we, we have continued to since then. Um, because as well, I do, we do get calls about that. Um, as much as there were people attending the PIC, there are probably just as many people who weren't able to attend. And so if I could have that information as well, and again, I don't need a huge document. All I need is just um, you know, a one-page document that has that information on it would be most appreciated. What I would like to do, though, is, is clarify that the, the position of the Ministry of Transportation is, is that expropriation is a last resort. As I said, they want to deal on a willing seller, willing buyer basis. So if a resident or a property owner out there uh, is interested in selling their property, then that's not an expropriation, hopefully. It is a, a, a land purchase. And I appreciate that, but through you, Chair, sometimes that willing buyer, willing seller, uh, people don't understand their rights going into that process. So it may end up being of more of a benefit to the MTO 
and to the province than it is to those residents. And so as the representative for the area, it is very important to me that my residents understand what their rights are. And, uh, you know, if that puts you folks in any kind of a conflict, then by all means give us the information. As the councillor, I can certainly have that conversation with them. I want to make sure that they understand just, just what, um, what their rights are, what they don't need to do, more importantly, uh, and how long they can wait. That would be very helpful. All right, thank you. Um, and through you, Chair, the, the um, other area I want to talk about here is timing. When did this process for this particular project, when did it start? Before the... Before the in 2010, this project began. It's been active since then. Oh, since, since 2010? Yes. Well, 2010. Yes. All right, but through you, Chair, when did you actually start? This has been 10 years in the making, oh. I'm sure. Yeah, no, it's been a long yes. time. In fact, as I said, the, there was an environmental assessment and a design done that was approved in 2003. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yes. Um, and so just, just, you know, to understand, particularly the businesses that are located at Highway 5 and 6, they're going to have to, uh, many of them will have to close down, they'll have to move. And so not getting information on this project has been, has created a particular angst for them. And I'm still getting questions, when is this going to be on the five-year plan? I understand that it's reviewed annually, but are we getting close now, or are we still another five to ten years away? That sort of shovels in the ground, the question. Is it when we're going to actually be starting Absolutely. construction? Absolutely. Thank you, Chair. It's, it's really hard to say, in honesty. Uh, you know, the ministry, has, they're currently focused on uh, they're on improving the existing infrastructure and on pavements and on bridges. Um, that's sort of our focus. Um, these types of expansion projects have been sort of put on hold because of budgetary issues. So it's, it's really hard to say when they'll find the funds for this. They do, as, as Don said, they do look at the program every year on a yearly basis and they, they look at trying to uh, put those types of projects on that capital program, but it's, it's very difficult to say when exactly that may be. Just for the record, Dad, we didn't hear when you were introduced what your name and position is. So. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, my name is Martin Michalek. I work with the Ministry of Transportation. I'm the area manager for MTO Highway Engineering Office. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mark um, and Don. And, you know, I, I appreciate that, but that does not help the residents and the, and the businesses that are located there because, the, you know, are they looking at another two years? Are they looking at five? Are they looking at ten? So in order to do future planning, that's quite difficult. And we had a meeting with some of the businesses and, and you heard them, I think, loud and clear. Okay. Loud and clear about what uh, some of the angst was. Um, those are really all my questions. We've been through this several times in, in different meetings and, and I've certainly been apprised by our staff. Uh, Diana and the team, they've done, uh, done a wonderful job. But the, the really important part of this comes down to making sure the residents are informed and that they're informed in a timely manner, not only about the project, but what their rights are. And that's what I need to have some assurances on. Um, so at the appropriate time, uh, Chair, I will move this recommendation. We can't hold this up any longer. We need to get going. Uh, the, the, um, that whole community, the water down area, is just going to be under siege for the next 10 years. And in all fairness to the residents that are living up there, um, they've already been under siege for the last two or three years. This is going to absolutely cripple my community. We have to get going on this. So thank you. It will be seconded by Councillor Johnson. Thank you. Well, I'll come back to you once we're finished our speaker list. And, and for speakers, I have Councillor Jackson, Councillor Clark, and Councillor Pearson. Did you have your hand up? Okay. And Don, just for clarity, the Tim Hortons and Wendy's, will they be closing or will they be accommodated in the design? Um, Mr. Deputy Mayor, that's up to them. Uh, we have accommodated their access. And we've had a number of meetings with them, and we are still not clear what their plans are. Okay. Councillor Jackson. Thanks, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, and uh, Diana, thanks for the preamble of the presentation, and Don and Mark for um, the presentation, your answers. Just three or four just general questions, Mr. Deputy Mayor, through to Don. So, Don, on the interchange costs, it's uh, approved 75-25 split, 
and ours is capped at seven and a half million. So I'm just asking hypothetically, if the cost were to go to 40, 50 million hypothetically for the interchange, and our seven and a half million represents only five or 10 or 15% from the original 75, 25, that cap sticks. Madam, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, through to Don, is that's that correct? My, that's my understanding. Okay, that's good to know, because uh, I, I know with the project cost and that what can happen, and sometimes it, there's some uh, conditions, if you will, that uh, we didn't anticipate this, so the city may have to cough up more, but that's ironclad. Ours is capped on at seven and a half million. Yes. Thank you. Don, uh, in the staff report, um, it says, the 5-6 interchange project is currently not contained within the province's five-year capital forecast. Somebody help me understand that with all this uh, acceleration and need to do this, and yet within the current provincial government. Somebody want to explain that through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, please? Well, it, simply put, in the province of Ontario, the Ministry of Transportation, every three or four years, comes out with a capital budget on construction across the whole province. And if a project is listed in that uh, capital budget, then it is uh, direct, funding is directed for it and it can be implemented. If a project is not in that capital budget, then there's no funding being directed to the project. So if we were, I know we're not ready to start tomorrow for Councillor Partridge's sake primarily and Councillor Pursuit as the other Flamborough rep, so it's not even, the money's not even in the provincial capital budget. I find it a little bizarre and yet the presentation is one of urgency. So I'm not laying this on the messenger's lap, Don, but I'm just really perplexed by that. Any well, further comment? Yes, I, I think you have to consider the complexity of this project. It, it was and is necessary to get the detailed design of that interchange and all the associated road changes finalized in part so that number one, the, the residents and the property owners and the businesses know what's going on and also for the ministry to start negotiating about the purchase of property. That doesn't necessarily um, uh, hold up the construction of the project. The project, as you said, will be construction ready when the time comes that the budgeting is provided by the province. Okay, appreciate that explanation. Uh, and now this is more a parochial award issue for Councillor Partridge, but I was just uh, um, I was just found curious, uh, the bullet point about removing residential driveways on Highway 6. People with properties on Highway 6, they know that this is coming, Mr. Deputy Mayor, through to Don? Yes, they do. And what? And they're going to make alternate arrangements without their driveway access onto Highway 6? No, if a property uh, is losing its access onto Highway 6, the property will be, will be acquired by the province. Oh, I see. Okay, so goodbye Homestead. I get that. And lastly, Mr. Deputy Mayor, through to Don. Don, you've said consultation with Burlington and Halton region, and yet the province and city of Hamilton are the only ones funding this. So in spite of traffic coming from many regions, I'm just curious about the consultation aspect, considering they're not funding partners. Mr. Deputy Mayor, through to Don, please. The uh, consultation with the city of Burlington and the region of Halton was, was dictated primarily by individual property owner issues. And the, and the City of Burlington and the Region of Halton were drawn into those discussions. Oh, by individual business or residential property well, owners? For example, the three properties that are on the south side of Mountain View Road mm -hmm. are actually in the City of Burlington. Okay. And again, the area we're talking about for this project is just north to about Parkside Drive, because I've driven up there a number of times, and just east and west on 5, uh, just past, if you will, the commercial, the immediate commercial areas, Don? Yes. That's basically what we're talking about. And, and south to the edge of the escarpment. Okay. Thanks so much, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Clark. All right. uh, through you, Chair, I just wanted to uh, clarify one uh, qu question that was asked by Councillor Jackson. Uh, Mountain Brow Road is a boundary road between the City of Hamilton and the City of Burlington. We have an agreement in place with the City of Burlington that if there's any uh, improvements to Mountain Brow Road, we cost share those improvements. So there will be a portion of the Mountain Brow Road improvements uh, that will be paid by half by the City of Burlington. So there will be that 75 split between the MTO and that 25% split will be split in half between City of Hamilton and MTO or City of Burlington. Thank you for that, Diana. And that's locked in the agreement. The City of Burlington is aware of that then? Mr. Deputy uh, Mayor, through to Diana. They are aware of it. We're just currently trying to negotiate uh, the amount. Thank you for that. Thanks, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Councilor Clark. Deputy Mayor, thank you for the opportunity to ask a, a couple of questions here. Um, 
I am keen to know whether or not the MTO has started to access the properties that they're going to need for the widening and the construction. I'll start off answering. The, the ministry has identified the properties that they need to acquire. Um, the residents or the owners of those properties have been notified that their properties will be required. Whether there is actually any negotiations between the province and the property owner really depends on whether the property owner wants to begin those discussions. Some of, some of them have, and other ones have not, for whatever reason. To be fair for my colleagues, similar to an expropriation, <laughs> the province would try to negotiate their market value. Failing that, they can go to that's the process, yes. Um, I was surprised that I didn't see a critical timeline or, or path. I, I'm hearing dates out there. Um, I'm hearing that it's not in the capital budget. But that doesn't mean that the minister and the ministry don't have critical timelines telling them what year they expect to begin the work, tendering or designing or, and all the rest of it. Or, can we have access to that? Can we have the crystal ball that tells us the future when it's going to start? Right now, we don't have any of that. So to Mark, my do you want to take time? Dundas, I, and and I, I know they exist because I used to see them and read them. So I think the ministry is sort of being proactive on this project, right? We're, we're, uh, we've hired a consultant to do the detailed design. We're putting the, the contract together, um, you know, um, we have been uh, contacting local residents. The, the complete implications for local residents is not, com is not uh, for sure in place at this time. You know, until we revise the detailed design, you know, our property office hasn't approached um, all the property owners impacted yet as, as the d as design sort of gets revised, right? So that, that process sort of all, all has to take place. As, as I was saying, the ministry is being proactive. We, we're acquiring properties where we can. We've taken properties at the interchange um, a few years ago. Um, we're continuing that sort of amicable process with local residents, and we're trying to be proactive as, as we put a contract and get this sort of in place uh, and, and have it ready to go when the funding is there. But unfortunately, I don't have an answer for you in terms of the funding. Um, you know. It, 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 it is a decision that has to be made and uh, when they review the priorities for the provincial budget and and um, as I mentioned our the province's uh, priorities are, 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 are uh, the mandate at the moment are to focus uh, less on expansion and a little more on uh, in, uh, current infrastructure improvements and bridges and pavements so that that's sort of where we're heading at the moment but that can change um, and you know it, it's really difficult to predict uh, in terms of funding and whether when this can be actually put on the capital budget. I just don't have an answer for you. Mayor, I'm having a bit of a challenge understanding if it's proactive, then they should have some indication of down the road. Is it going to be 2015, 2016? When are they shooting for? We know it's not in cement. No, it's not cast in concrete. It may be rolled in asphalt, though. Is it? Is exactly. there uh, um, if, if, approximate date when you expect the tender to be called on this? Uh, a non-committal date, just so we have a guide. Thank you, sir. I, I just, I really can't comment on that. I, uh, unfortunately, um, you know, we will have the contract, the completion of the detailed design, and, and everything in place by next spring. But at that time the province will have to look at their priorities and make that call in terms of when, what timeline they're anticipating for this project. I really couldn't say any more than that this time. Councillor Clark. And the last question was, when this first started out many years ago, Burlington indicated they weren't going to pay for anything. Um, so now have indicated that they are going to pay for a portion of what's directly in their boundary. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, Mountain Brow, half of Mountain Brow Road. Thank you, Councillor Pearson. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, and thank you for the presentation information. Um, I, a few of my questions have been answered, and I too have concerns that we don't have a timeline. But my next question that was contingent on that answer was the whole project itself, and I know you anticipate how many years this is a build out, 
is the project being phase three? Like you're not going to have the whole, the whole intersection. Uh, we're we're expecting that under optimum conditions, it would take two construction seasons to build the interchange uh, and everything associated with it, with perhaps a third and final construction season just to, to wrap everything up and finalize it. That's for both all for the whole for the system. whole interchange and the, and the, the, the road improvement the highway improvements etc and the municipal road improvements if if the city decides they want to have that done at the same time which would probably be a wise idea but uh, implications and complications come up even just on residential yeah. streets uh, as far yeah. as being able to address current traffic flows at the time. So. You see, in, in building the interchange and in building the highway improvements, that's where some of these accesses to properties are going to have to be closed. So there will be some municipal road construction that will be required as part of that. It, just, it, it has to be to provide access to properties. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. And I certainly have to concur and sympathize with my colleague in uh, Flamborough, Councillor Partridge, because I can't imagine the nightmare that she's going to have to deal with in the next number of years. Um, but we do need to get on with this. Thank you. And the last speaker is Councillor Powers. Speaking from experience, and my ward included the interchange at York, York uh, Road down at the bottom. And, and, and the timing is absolutely no surprise. I mean, there was absolutely nothing in the forecasts at the time we were talking about the interchange and we were talking about the interchange that you're talking about now up at 5 and 6 uh, back in the 1990s. So um, it wasn't on the forecast, but it was something that needed to be done. So obviously through the persistence of the, uh, of, of, of the residents and the ward councillors, um, we pushed for that. And the planning that you're doing became the integrable part that allowed the minister and the ministries, in other words, it was a shovel-ready project that was there to proceed and, uh, and allowed the ministry to move it into the five-year forecast and move it early into the five-year forecast to make it happen. This planning needs to be done, otherwise it's going to be on a, on a planning horizons for, I'm going to call it, decades to come. So we need to move ahead on the recommendation before us, Mr. Mr. Chair, and, uh, and, and allow staff to move ahead. And, uh, and, and certainly the public consultation is essential. The project the interchange was well informed. You've alluded to the contact information. Staff were extraordinary in responding almost immediately to, uh, to telephone inquiries or, or, or emails or whatever the case. And we would expect exactly the same for Councillor Partridge. And, and her constituents from that standpoint. So uh, um, informing the, uh, the, the impacted neighbors, and it's more than just the neighbors because uh, you know, the traffic flow will be affected both in an east-west and north-south um, um, direction. Um, the idea of doing everything all at once, I just have some angst about that, but I'm sure you'll, have, you'll think that as it, uh, as, as it play plays out from the standpoint and it's and it's gone through many macerations as, as my recollection was it was going to be uh, there was going to be an overpass on the on the east-west direction with uh, with the road going underneath and that I'm thinking this is probably is um, you were look you're directed to go back and come up with a solution but something that's more economical that uh, that the the province could could afford because I'm my, my thinking was that the um, original proposal was pretty close to twice um, what's being contemplated now in a, in, in a budget thing. So let's get let's move ahead with it and give Councillor Partridge and uh, and us the approvals too. Thank you. I think Councillor Partridge, you're moving that motion seconded by Councillor Powers. Uh, yes, I will be moving it, and it was seconded by Councillor Johnson. Councillor Johnson. Okay. Discussion on the motion. Seeing none. All in favor? Opposed. The motion carries. Thank you very much for coming out today. Thank you, Councillor Jackson. Second by Councillor Pearson. All in favor? Carried. It is now 11 o'clock, and we're going to move on to item 8.4 on the agenda, which is an added item respecting the 2013 Hamilton Police Services operating budget. And we recall that at the March 21st budget meeting, the committee made a motion to invite representatives from the police service to attend a general issues committee meeting to uh, respond to questions with respect to the police services budget. And um, I think at this time, 
I'll list, I'll read out the names of the people who are here, to, and in case council members don't know who they are, maybe you could just wave when I, uh, I mention your name. And um, so the first is uh, Nancy DiCagario, who's chair of the Hamilton Police Services Board. Thank you. Madeline Levy, the vice chair. Thank you. Uh, Irene Station, a board member. We got uh, the deputy chief, uh, Ken Linders, who is also the acting chief. And Ken, you may want to make your way down to the front. Uh, deputy uh, chief, Eric Gert, is here. Uh, Marco Vicente, legal counsel. Thank you. Ted Mason, finance manager. And you may want to make your way down to the front also, along with uh, Deputy Gert. Uh, John Randazzo, uh, assistant finance manager. Thank you, John. And Lois Moore, and the administrator to the board. Thank you. Well, you're all here. So um, I, I turn it open now to the committee. This is your opportunity to uh, ask the police the questions that you had at the, at the last meeting. So who would like to go first? Councillor Duvall. Councillor Whitehead next. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, through you to, uh, and I don't know who can answer this. Um, on, on the letters that I received from the chairman and from uh, our police chief, they refer to a 3.62 budget, maintenance budget, to, um, in order to meet the conditions of the collective agreement between the Hamilton, uh, between the board and the Hamilton Police Association. So I would just ask, um, like to know, my understanding is the collective agreement has expired as of December 2012. And so that would be a, a continuance. There would be no enhancements at this particular time because there's collective bargaining is going on. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to find out how they came to 3.62% for an enhancement of a collective agreement that has expired. Ken, do you want to take that? Sorry, Acting Chief. Actually, I'll start uh, with it. Uh, I mean, obviously, um, for the 2013 uh, budget, there will be a salary contingency for uh, a contract that's still not negotiated. So we have to put a salary contingency in there. Uh, but every, everything else, the, that 3.62, is fulfilling all the other contractual obligations. And Ted maybe can continue on from there. Through you, Deputy Mayor, um, just to provide some uh, clarity on that, is the 3.62 percent? Uh, it includes an estimated um, contractual, you know, whatever the estimated contractual impacts are. are we're looking at um, through. Um, other comparative, uh, you know, the other police services there. So, uh, <clears throat> so it does include an estimate for what can happen in 2013. And along with that, uh, it includes the uh, benefit changes, uh, the OMERS uh, contribution rate increase. So it's, uh, it encompasses the, you know, what we are looking at <clears throat> forward for 2013. Okay, so to you, Mr. Chair, and I take that that on a hypothetical matter, it's, it is accounting for any kind of increase that may happen, but we don't know what that actual number is. Is that what I'm hearing? Well, I would suspect the answer is you know what it is, but we can't share it publicly yet. Okay. And we may have to go in camera if you want uh, any further information on specifics. All right. Um, my other question is, it refers to the hiring of 21 officers, um, and that would be included in this 3.62% um, request. Is this, my understanding is the hiring of the new officers will be done at the uh, end of the year, so it doesn't really show a true cost of what the um, officers are going to be costing us this year, but it will sh definitely should bring up the budget for next year. Is, is that correct? Can that? The uh, tag team on, the, on this answer. The actual approved budget by the Police Services Board is 3.71, and that included the uh, 20 officers plus one civilian. The uh, The Contract obligations as moving forward, forward into 2014 would be 0.75. And Ted can answer any other specific details. 
Okay, um, so the, the Ken, then what I have here in front of him, uh, signed by uh, Chief DeCare, is even if we establish that the council did it at 3.62%, he's made it very clear that he's intending to hire the 21 officers, whether it's 3.71, whether it's 3.62. That is correct. If, if you've seen the letter that the chief sent council yesterday, the maintenance budget is 3.62. You add the 20 officers plus one civilian to bring up the budget to a 4.05. And then what we've done is uh, found other deferrals and savings to bring it down to 3.71. The difference between 3.71 and 3.62 is a $119,000 gap. And the hiring of 20 officers is such a priority for our service that we would look for whatever avenue we could to ensure that we hire the 20 officers, even if the council comes back at 3.62. Mr. Paul? If council came back with a lower number, would the 21 officers still be included? If council came back at a lower number, that uh, position would have to go back to the board and the board would have to decide what its next steps would be if, in fact, they would, would accept the budget or they would look at other uh, venues. Okay. Thank you. Hey, Councillor Whitehead. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, it's my understanding that we had an uh, inadequacy audit by the ministry. Can you uh, just tell us how that went? That is right. Uh, we had an adequacy audit by the ministry on four specific areas within the service. And uh, we're proud to say that there was zero recommendations. They have already, the ministry has done uh, uh, eight specific audits across the province already, and it's the first time they've ever come to a service that had zero recommendations. So uh, basically our policies and systems are in place. Our officers are trained to uh, fulfill what is adequacy, what adequacy requires them to do. Um, so we, we accomplished that with the current complement, is that correct? That is correct. The, audit, the specific audit did not look at the entire organization. What it did, it looked at areas such as missing persons and how we respond to missing persons. It also looked at hostage barricade situations and, and how we con control a uh, uh, situation when there's a hostage barricade situation. And we looked at other policy uh, areas. So basically what the audit did was made sure that the service is following adequacy standards in specific areas and that we are able to respond accordingly and that the officers have the training, knowledge, skills and ability to do that. So that's what they're looking at, making sure our policies are in place. It did not look at the entire service. It did not look at staffing levels. Uh, it looked at those specific areas. Now, the ministry's done audits before. Uh, did they look at staffing levels before? Uh, through you, Deputy Mayor, they have not looked at staffing levels before. Traditionally, their, their audits uh, are on specific areas. The last audit that we had under Chief Mullen was about uh, the business planning process and uh, our firing range. And out of that audit, there was 21 recommendations that came out. But they, they can't look at the entire organization. Obviously, it's too complex. If you look at even our policies, we have over 197 policies on how to effectively operate the, the police service. So they can only look at specific areas at that time. So it's safe to say then, currently, we have no adequacy uh, uh, issues in regards to the complement as determined by the Ministry of uh, Solicitor General. It would be safe to say that we are meeting adequacy standards in the four areas that they checked. Thank you. Um, the uh, seven-year, uh, what's it called, the seven, Hamilton um, Police Services Staffing 7, Performance Management Plan, Staffing and Deployment Study, prepared by, by June, August 2011 by the seven-year staffing committee. In that report, it indicates that uh, any decision in regards to uh, uh, policy uh, needs to consider uh, citizens willing to fund. How did you test that in, the, in this study? That study, which was prepared for the board, uh, was to review what our projections are for the next seven years. Um, was that specific theory tested? I can't say it is, but it's a general terms that uh, you, would, you would guess that 
the area that you're talking about would have to be considered when looking at staffing numbers. So the question was how much proactive time should be patrol division? So part of the plan drives uh, uh, what kind of resources are needed. And in the report clearly indicates that this policy decision, not a calculated decision, it is based on the desired level of performance and what the citizens are willing to fund. And so I guess the key question, for, certainly for the citizens uh, in this community and that this council, is how, how did we test that? How do we determine the citizen willing to fund the performance that we've decided on? Your point is that, that if you read the staffing report, it talks about a 40-60 model where the officers respond at 60% of the time reactively and 40% proactively. When we talk about proactive policing, we're talking about crime prevention. We're talking about uh, arresting people with outstanding Mr. warrants. Mr. Chair, the question, I'm not asking to clarify the, 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 the policy. So the question the is? I'm asking specifically, I mean, it's not my writing, it's, it's theirs, it's their study. And it says clearly, and I'm going to underline this because I think that's the crux of the discussion we're having. We're bit, we're, what Councilor, citizens why don't you, are willing let, to fund? Why don't you let the deputy answer that question, then you can re-ask it if you didn't get the question answer. Uh, well, question Mr. I don't want to uh, drive into uh, a, a lobby. I don't want to drive into uh, a, a marketing. I want to drive into specific, I'm asking a specific question on a uh, this particular comment in the report that says that to, to decide on what uh, okay, action. Very, very you need to determine your citizens again, willing to fund. Ask your question again then. So Sorry. I'm asking uh, what level of study did we do to determine citizens willing to fund? Eric, you, you want to take that? Yes, if I could speak to that through you, Chair. Uh, in essence, the governance model that's enacted through the Police Service Act answers that question. Within relation to this study, there is no specific model that would govern what is adequate and effective across all police services across, in essence, the entire world. We looked at the IECP, which is the International Association of Chiefs of Police, and looked at those models that exist out there. Within most of those models, there's a provision that the community will determine what is adequate and effective within the community that it serves. Towards that end, the governance that's in place is obviously through the Police Service Board, which then speaks to Council. So that provision to determine what is that effective is in essence the role of the Board and the role of Council. So can I ask, uh, uh, the, qu the question clearly to me is, uh, we uh, and our staff and our, our Joanne Creel have done, uh, uh, and our finance people have done a remarkable job determining affordability in this community. What, uh, um, what, if any, research was done or interaction was done with uh, city staff to determine the affordability issue in this community? As I stated, not to repeat, that determination is done through board. They've determined a 3.71% increase. The board then presents that to council, and the options are to accept, decline, or send it back with a different amount. So that authority rests with both the board and council, in my opinion. Appreciate in terms of studying staff or having studies that exist out there to determine a benchmark for what is affordable, adequate, and effective, to my original point, within the studies themselves, there is no standing benchmark. What the Act provides for is that the uh, city itself, through those governance models, determines what that is. I think if we were to uh, impart that or come up with a number that we felt, uh, we'd be overstepping our authority to do that. And I, and I appreciate that answer. Um, the 3.62, my understanding of the 3.62, there's a point, and uh, this is a question directed to Ted. My understanding is the uh, answer, or sorry, the 1.18 is the um, pulling from reserves. Is that correct? That's included in that 3.62? That's correct. 0.18? Yes. Is there a 0 0.53 that is, uh, uh, that is doing with benefits as well? That's included in that 3.62? Included in the 3.62, we have, uh, with respect to, to employee benefits, we've got uh, uh, OMERS at 0.87. We have uh, uh, government benefits, employer benefits, and retiree benefits. The uh, uh, government benefits at 0.25, employer benefits at 0 0.20, and retiree benefits 0.25. Appreciate that. So, um, and I don't see uh, 
Councilor Morelli asked a question uh, publicly at the board uh, what the maintenance budget was uh, without the 20 officers. I think the response we received then was 3.33. Is that correct? Uh, th uh, through you, uh, Deputy Mayor, <clears throat> from the position, uh, the board approved position at 3.71%, you take out the 20 officers, you're at 3.33%. Okay, those are all my questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Collins. Thanks, uh, Mr. Chairman. I just want to follow up on that. So you take out the 20 officers, you get down to 3.33%. And then if council was to. Um, if we were concerned, as we uh, noted in our um, resolution, in the resolution about the use of reserves, um, the 3.33 percent then goes to what figure through you to Ted? Ted, um, th uh, through you, Deputy Mayor, it goes to 3.52 percent. Okay, so that's the number that we have in front of us um, with the motion that was put the other day. And I, I just want to confirm, there's been a tug of war of uh, definitions and words over the last, uh, I guess, well, several weeks now, as it relates to what a maintenance budget is. And I think um, my definition would be one that uh, it's the total cost of the service from the prior year that would include uh, salary and wage benefits um, that, would, uh, that are pressures for the, the in-year budget that you're looking at. And um, so when we've heard from police, uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, we've heard that, um, in fact, a maintenance budget includes, would include, uh, the hiring of the new officers. And so maybe I can first ask to um, Mr. Zagarek what our definition of a, a maintenance budget is. Through you? Michael? Through, through you, Mr. Uh, Deputy Mayor. Uh, our maintenance budgets represent uh, as it relates to inflationary pressures uh, to support existing service levels through existing complement. Uh, any enhancements with respect to increased service levels or increases in complement are brought forward through program enhancements. Okay. So then I, and, and maybe this could be answered by either Mr. Zagarek or Ted, then if we're looking at 3.52 with the definition that Mr. Zagarek had just uh, referenced, I would assume then that the 352 then becomes in the city's, using the city's definition of no new complement and no new services, essentially 352 then becomes the maintenance budget. Your question is directed to Ted or the Either one. Ted or, or, or That's correct. Uh, the officers are out of the 3.522 budget. Okay. And one final issue that we had last week, and it was surrounding the um, use of capital and there were some questions at the last minute as to whether capital was in or out. And I'm, I'm certain that Mr. Zagarek had clarified the same day through uh, your assistance, Ted, that in fact the 352 is inclusive of the capital costs that the city will be providing uh, to the police as it relates to the, the budget of $140,414,620. To be clear, we did confirm with both parties that in fact it does include uh, capital financing. That's, that's correct. Okay. Those are the only questions I have, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Powers. Thank you very much. Thank you, and I thank Councillor Duvall for asking the question, but I just want to repeat the question and just get clarity on it. We have uh, two pieces of correspondence before them. One is a, uh, a letter uh, directed to uh, us on April the 2nd from the, uh, the Chief. And the other one is a piece of correspondence from uh, Mr. Gregorio, the chair of the Police Services Board, dated March the 27th. So the, the clarity I require is, um, is both the Police Services Board has made a commitment to approving uh, 20 additional police constables and one civilian. And in the chief's correspondence, he's confirming that's the desire. So I guess the end result is uh, there will be a hiring of 21 individuals to supplement the, uh, the, the operations of, of uh, the Hamilton Police. For you, Mr. Uh, Deputy Mayor, that is the position of the board. The board has approved 3.71, and that did include the 20 officers and one civilian hire, and that's what the board has approved. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Jackson. 
Thanks, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor. First of all, um, Acting uh, Chief Leanders and uh, Chairperson DiGregorio, to the service and to the board members, thank you very, very much for being here today and taking time out of your busy lives. I, I really appreciate it. So, um, Deputy, um, let me just ask, and if some of these questions are repeat questions in, in our own different words, uh, Deputy uh, Leanders, please um, understand, in light of the machinations over the last month or so, and trying to everybody be on the same page, one way or the other, trying to nail down numbers so that we can make our own informed decision, and whether we all end up in agreement or not between the board and council, Mr. Deputy Mayor, we're just trying to know that we're all dealing from the same script of data information. So through you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, to Acting Chief Lean Durst. So Ken, if the 21 new bodies are hypothetically approved, What's the annualized cost next year for the 21? Through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, please. Take that, Ted. Or Ted, Ted Mason, please. Yeah. Um, through you, Deputy Mayor, the uh, cost of the, uh, of the officers, it's going to be um, one and a half, a little over one and a half million dollars. And what that represents, um, and we've talked about it uh, quite a few times, for 2013, the impact of the officers is $511,000, which represents 0.38% of, of, the, of uh, the total increase. So of the 3.71 that was approved by the board, 0.38 um, represents that, uh, uh, the officers. So um, there, the impact on 2014 is, is going to be 0.75, so a little over uh, an additional million dollars will have to be annualized in the 2014 budget. So there will be a 0.75% uh, um, impact. So, Ted, thank you for that elaborate answer. But to my uh, very uh, direct question, uh, you said about a $1.5 million, give or take, impact on 14 annualized, correct? Um, that's correct, but the, the first part of it, we're going to have half a million in the 2013 budget and then up to one and a half in the 2014 okay. budget. Thank you, Ted. Correct. But it's one and a half million for 14 annualized, correct? That's right. Thank you, Ted. Thank you. Secondly, um, through you to whoever can possibly answer this, whether a Deputy Leaners or Ted or any of the other uh, staff, um, if the estimate, and I haven't been on the police board years ago, I respect the fact that come contract negotiation time, you try to estimate uh, negotiations and possible increases of wages benefits based on uh, a rolling number over the years, based on pattern bargaining, Mr. Deputy Mayor, that um, occurs across the province. So I respect that. In light of... Um, in light of uh, the um, association president's uh, letter and comments, um, let me ask you a hypothetical, Mr. Deputy Mayor, through to Acting Chief Leaders or whoever wants to answer this. If the estimated increase that you folks have built into this uh, budget um, is not needed for negotiations, so you've built in, if I recall when I was there, we always built in an upset limit, hoping that that upset limit would ultimately be sufficient. If that upset limit is not ultimately needed, what would you do with that surplus amount? Mr. Deputy Mayor, through this, whoever can answer that, please. Probably Deputy Leaders would be better. And uh, through you, Deputy Mayor, the, um, traditionally what happens, as you know, when you sat on the Police Services Board, Councillor Jackson, is that you get an annual report at the end on, uh, on the plus or minus. And uh, I think you've heard from your previous meeting that this year we are uh, running a deficit. But traditionally, if there is uh, um, extra money at the end of the year because we were successfully negotiating a contract, that's reported back to the board, and then the board will decide uh, do they put it in reserves or, or how they uh, look after that. Thank you, uh, Deputy. I appreciate that. And lastly, Mr. Deputy Mayor, based on um, Councillor Whitehead's question, which he got the answer on maintenance budget with no new bodies, was 3.33 from Ted. Councillor Collins got um, 3.52 maintenance budget with no new bodies, exactly the same services based on Mr. Zagarek's definition for City Council from City Departments. So can I just, again, make sure, Mr. Deputy Mayor, the 3.33 and the 3.52 are both exactly the same maintenance budget, the difference being that 0.18 being 
the reserve component. Mr. Deputy Mayor, through you please for confirmation on that. That's correct. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Clark. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Deputy Mayor. So just to catch up then, what's the, the final figure we're now talking about? 3.52%? The budget before council from the board is 3.71. And that has not changed? That has not changed. That is the approved budget and that's what the board has pr proposed through to council. Okay. And can someone um, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, is there a total for overtime in the budget somewhere? Do you uh, have that number? I, I've gone through line by line. I can't find a Final figure there overtime. is an annual annualized overtime uh, indications. Usually, it's about 2.5 million. Correct, Ed? Uh, through you, Deputy Mayor, the total for overtime and court time is is 3.3 uh, million. Um, the uh, uh, the 2.5 million would be for overtime, and then the the, the remainder mm -hmm. for court time. So you track overtime and you track court time. Correct, Deputy Mayor? That's correct. And the overtime figure itself was 2.5 million? Yes, that's correct. And a lot has been said in the papers about the um, services, I guess, defendants, if you will, the people who are uh, off duty, suspended with pay. What's that total figure projected for this year coming? Well, let's talk about what it was in 2012. Without uh, crunching the numbers, it would probably be around $400,000. For how many officers? For the officers that are currently suspended. How many is that, Ken? Right now we have uh, four there. officers currently under suspension. And so when they're suspended, to be clear, someone else has to pick up their duties? That is correct. They're suspended and uh, as you know, we have no control under that. It's, it's a governor under the Police Services Act. They must be suspended by pay, but someone else will have to pick up their duties. That is correct. So the act requires them to be suspended with pay. Does it give you the latitude to put them on a desk for the four months so they're actually working? Uh, or washing cars in the morning or whatever? Actually, I'm going to let legal counsel respond to that. Uh, through you, sir, um, the right to suspend is uh, set out in Section 89 of the uh, Police Services Act. There is currently no option uh, for a police chief in this province to suspend uh, without pay. So all suspensions are um, with pay. There is, uh, in uh, depending on the nature of the um, misconduct that is alleged, there is the option of having the person work on a desk, and that does ha uh, happen from time to time, vis-a-vis um, -vis a, a reassignment to administrative duties. But that's based on an operational decision made by the chief and his command team with respect to the nature and the severity of the misconduct. Use your microphone, please. Thank you. Sorry about that. So I'm to assume that the four that are currently suspended, that the incidents were so heinous that they can't work a desk, answer phones, fill up paperwork, lick envelopes, wash cars for their pay? That is correct. We There's quite a bit of work and analysis that is done on each individual case and it's determined that, uh, that uh, they should be suspended with pay outside the organization. And just for clarity, none of the four officers who are currently suspended are doing administrative duties? That is correct. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Marula. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. And just through you two, to Mike Zagarek, uh, I've been getting a number of questions uh, surrounding the police budget. And I, I guess the, the positive aspect to this exercise that uh, we're pursuing is the revelation of how little accountability or control this council has 
related to the police budget. So through you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, to Mike, what is the, the global police budget to date? What is the bottom line amount that we tax uh, Hamilton residents? Ted? Or, or Mike, go uh, to For you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, uh, in terms of the global budget as approved by the board on February 19th, uh, it would, uh, the 3.71% uh, translates into a value of $140,676,370. Okay. So would it be fair to say it's the single largest budgetary expenditure of this council through you, Mr. Uh, Deputy Mayor? Uh, through you, Mr. Uh, Deputy Mayor, when we look at uh, our cost of services, you may recall that uh, we send out tax inserts Last year, the uh, average assessed home would have paid approximately $2,900. Of that, approximately 18% of that cost was police services related costs. Okay, so overall, is there another department that uh, we allocate uh, money to that surpasses that $140.5 million on an annual basis? So Mike, any other department like Public Works? I know it's the largest department we have. For you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, the uh, one service uh, that is uh, has a higher value than police services is, uh, it's actually two services, sorry. There's no one service. Uh, on the tax bill, uh, taxpayers would have seen a service referred to as public health and community services at $514, but again, those represent two departments and a number of services. Sorry, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, there is no one service uh, that we report a cost higher than police services. <coughs> okay, so in, in, in essence, uh, just for the record, we have the single largest financial impact on council, yet we have really no accountability as with respect to that single line budget item. Through you, Mr. Mayor, when you incorporate the downloading component of 120 million dollars, which we have no control over. Um, is that number in and around still $120 million through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor? To Mike? To Mike, yes. Okay. Through you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, it would still be uh, approximately $120 million with the offset of the uploading benefit net of inflationary pressures. Right. So combined, just for, for, for the record, combined, uh, 260 million dollars of taxpayers money that we collect and the average person perceives us to be in control of we have absolutely no control over and to you mr. deputy mayor what is our entire budget um, with respect to the taxation budget okay so the levy budget not the capital and not the no, just, uh, just the rate what's the levy budget uh, Mike through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, our net levy for 2013 is just over 700 million. Just over 700 million. Correct. So nearly, nearly half of our of our operating budget, we have absolutely no control over. Through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, if we were to divest ourselves from from the police budget, and if the province were to upload that download, how much would that represent an actual decrease in taxes? Understand the question, Mike? Sorry, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. If I could have the question sure, repeated yeah. again. When you combine that $260 million, so if we could decrease taxes by $260 million, what would that represent per household? Through you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, the $260 million would translate into approximately one third of our uh, net levy, so if you took one-third of the $2,900 an average household paid in 2012, it would be somewhere in the area, assuming of about a reduction of $730. $730 per household? Sorry. Uh, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, more so. It would be nine? Million more now. Just over $900 per household. 
So nearly a thousand dollars per household, or uh, basically thirty uh, percent of our taxes. So just for the record, so public, the public understands, because it seems like we get the brunt of all all, all criticism when in reality we recognize that it, it's not deserving. But I'm glad that uh, this has come to fruition because, frankly, I think we need to open up a dialogue about divesting ourselves from the police services. If, they're not gonna, if we're not going to be accountable, I'm not going door to door and representing these people that work so hard for their money to just basically go through this facade on an annual basis. I'm a huge supporter of police. I always have been. The one time that I'm becoming somewhat um, providing some scrutiny over it, all we're getting is, is basically defiance. And that defiance isn't to this council, it's to the public, and I find that disgraceful. Thank you very much. Councilman, just for clarity purposes, the budget was $140 million, we heard. How did you get it to 250 Just uh, to With the downloading people? file. The downloading file. Fire. Okay. The downloading, yeah. downloading file. Yeah. Downloading file. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, I was just trying to understand the arithmetic on that. Okay, uh, I have no more first time speakers. Second time speakers are Councillor Whitehead and Councillor Clark. Uh, my mind was uh, uh, more on, on, on comments than, than questions at this point, so this is the appropriate time to make provide some comments. Let me go to Councillor Clark. Councillor Clark, or com comments, yeah, so I go was, ahead. I just have one, one question. Now. Okay, go ahead, your question. I just need to clarify for the public. Thank you. Um, I did receive probably the largest package from the police services than I, than I ever have in the past. The one document that I did receive was actually the line-by-line -line budget, and I did get it from the police chief's office. But I just want to confirm that I haven't received anything since then that actually had I shouldn't use the same word, that had the actual expenditures for 2012. So um, you folks haven't sent me any other documentation other than the original budget that was provided through the police chief's office. The expenditures, expenditures for 2012 have not yet gone to the police services board. And so um, all that information still has to be presented to the police services board to, to uh, cause it, the board is the one that governs the service. That's, thank you, that just prompts another question that is very curious then. How does the police services board ascertain what the increase is going to be if they were not provided the actual expenditures from 2012, which as I understand it, Mr. Zagarek told us indicated there was a deficit. So clearly someone has the actual, so you're saying the police services board made their decision without seeing the actual expenditures? The police services board gets a monthly report on the actual expenditures, but when we close the books, that report has not yet gone to the police services board. And I'll let Ted continue on with the, this discussion. Um, in, in 2012, um, we had a, uh, an unfavorable variance at the end of the year of uh, $286,491. Um, the pri primary reason for, for the variance was the very high number of retirements that, we, that the service experienced in, in 2012. And that resulted in higher than, uh, than the budget sick leave uh, payouts. And that, so this, we have a sick leave reserve and um, the money, uh, the 286,491, will come from the sick leave reserve to offset the, the variance. Okay. But to be clear, the question I asked, I heard very clearly that the police services board did not receive a budget with the line by line expenditures in it for their deliberation this year. That is not correct. The budget process actually starts in August. And we work line by line with all the departments till we eventually get to what we believe is a budget. The chief and the deputies work through that. And then there is a committee within the police services board that actually go line by line uh, in the proposed budget. And that's when, it, when that committee has completed its work, then it is actually presented to the police services board. So the, the information that, that the board has not seen the budget is incorrect. So a committee of the board, 
I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Deputy, but this is important because I'm, this is a No, I actually, I have, to, I have to correct that. I'm going to ask Eric to respond to that. Eric? With the change in the process and obviously being open and accountable and publishing that, uh, there was no committee that met independently. Those uh, meetings happened in public at the Police Service Board uh, on November 27, 2012. Uh, the Hamilton Police Service presented their budget to the board at 5.25%. Since that time, we've had subsequent meetings into 2013. So for the purposes of establishing the original budget, uh, that happened in late 2012. So to have the actuals present was not possible, given the fact that we started those deliberations prior to the end of 2012. We wouldn't have the actual expenditures till year end. So However, the, the original statement was, was true in that the Police Services Board came to a budget deliberation without having the actual expenditures before them in that proposed budget. They we had don't have them yet. I, that's part of it, but they did have up to the third quarter by that point in terms of reporting to the board, but not the year-end totals. That's correct. Thank you. I would like to make comments at the end. Okay. Councillor Partridge, first-time speaker. Yes, thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, and uh, welcome, gentlemen. I just have a couple of questions. Um, we've, we've heard... Uh, We've heard lots of percentages being thrown around. I just want to confirm one more time what I thought, what I think I've been hearing. The 3.3 percent that is without the hiring of the 20 officers. Is that correct? That is correct. Thank you. Does that mean that the 3.3 would be with the 20 officers hired, but the amount deferred to 2014? I don't think so. Just uh, there was a point. I'd like to hear it. I'd like to hear it, like to just, hear it just, from just, the police. I want to feed it back to you because I want to manage this meeting later. The 3.3. Then there was a plus 0.18 to reverse the um, money that was taken out of reserve. That's correct. which brought it up to 3.52. <clears throat> I get that. My question was not about that. My question was about the 20 officers. So, does that 3.3 mean no 20 officers, no extra hires? no deferring to 2014. That is correct. Thank you. And just my last question is, following up on what Councillor Marula had said about this body ultimately not having accountability or, or being involved in, in um, establishing what the budgets are, is council, uh, does council establish the, buzz, the budget? I'd like to hear that from your folks. Actually, council's position under section 39 of the Police Services Act is either to approve the Police Services Board budget or to deny it or to set it. And it is the Police Services Board that is the one that actually sets the budget and ensures effective and efficient police service in the community. Thank you. That's exactly what I thought. So I'm a little confused in the letter that we have from the chair of the board. The second to last paragraph says, once council has established the budget, and I just, I found that very confusing. So that came from the chair of the board. So we do not, as a council, we do not establish the budget. For you, Deputy Mayor. It is to approve or to disapprove. You can approve or disapprove. Thank you. Or you can set a number. Or set okay. a number. But and we can establish the budget. Thank no, you. That you answers set a number, my question. And that would go back to the board for deliberations. Mayor Patina, first time speaker. Through you, Deputy Chief Flinders, what does the phrase acceptable level of victimization mean? That would be a term to, de to determine how many victims you think are allowed in a community. And, and I think you're, you're referring to if you cut a budget, how much could we anticipate additional victimization? Well, what I would say is that there is, a, there is a level of victimization currently. There are so many thousand people, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, who are affected by criminal activity in the year, and that's, that's the victimization, correct? That's correct. Okay. So currently, uh, in one category of policing, we, I understand through our discussions with the board that we have currently one officer assigned per 100 child abuse cases, is that correct? That's correct, our child abuse branch are with our 
current complement of seven investigators are running over 100 cases each person. Each. What is the trend of child abuse cases? We're seeing the trend actually increase in, in that area as well as many other areas throughout the service. So by freezing the current complement, we are in fact deeming that as an acceptable level of victimization. And I think where you're getting that is what our, what our perception is of maintenance versus council's perception of maintenance. The 20 officers that we are, uh, have been approved by the police services board will allow our service to continue providing the same level of service that they received in 2012. Through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, what would be required if we were to, because the Toronto Police Service has frozen the Toronto budget, what would the level of service or officer uh, increase be required for us to freeze at the same level as Toronto? Through you, Deputy Mayor, if you wanted to compare us to Toronto, Toronto currently runs at 201 officers per 100,000 at a cost of $946 per household. Hamilton Police Service runs at 153 officers at a cost of $657 per household. For us to be like Toronto, you'd have to hire 300 officers and add $3 million to our budget. Um, uh, but Councillor Marula, excuse me, could you just listen to the answer here? Okay. <coughs> Could you repeat what you just said, Deputy Chief? The, the budget, actually, the Hamilton Police Service budget recognizes Hamilton's fiscal concerns and, and ensures our city is effective and efficient in their police service to ensure the safety of our community. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. If, you. if you just take the chair for... So there's two definitions of a maintenance budget. Uh, there was Mike's interpretation and there was the Chief's interpretation. And there was a resolution that was placed before a committee on March 21st and was subsequently referred to today to allow for clearance of questions to take place. That will come back to uh, a committee of the uh, General Security Committee tomorrow. And I assume you've seen that resolution. And just for clarity purposes, uh, do you understand that the resolution that uh, was placed before a committee and will be voted on tomorrow is Mike Zagarek's definition of a maintenance budget? We do understand that, um, that your interpretation of maintenance budget is, is the 3.52 or the 333. Our definition is the 3.71, which is approved by the police service. Yeah. And, and I'm just a little concerned that it will be misunderstood when it comes back to you. That's why, on the record, I want it very clearly understood that a maintenance budget, from this resolution's perspective, is no new 20 officers or one new civilian. Uh, uh, can you just confirm that that's, uh, you uh, understand that's the intent of this motion? I do understand the intent of the motion. Okay. I'll take a chair back and we'll go to comments now. We have questions again, so uh, let me just start another speaker's list then. So, Councillor Pearson, you're a first time speaker, so why don't you go Thank first you, and I'll go to Deputy Councillor Mayor. Collins. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. And I just I appreciate the line of questioning that you just had. So, let me just clarify then the percentage of 3.33 is saying this is with no officers and one civilian completely out, but that does not preclude that the chief does not still pursue that. Is that correct for you, Mr. Deputy Mayor? That is correct. I want to be sure that's on the record. Thank you. Okay, and Councillor Collins. Mr. Chairman, through you, I just want to uh, clarify from a budget perspective how this impacts the city. And so the request, um, the formal request that we have on record through our own budget process is 3.72. Is that correct through you to Mr. Zagarek? What we've incorporated into the rate updates that Council has received to date the number we're looking at, I think, is the 372 figure or 371, just to, just to clarify. Mike, do you understand the question? Yeah. Uh, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, if I understand the question, uh, to date, our presentations have reflected police services 
at 3.9 percent, or 140 million nine hundred thirty-two thousand two hundred forty dollars. Okay, so it's it's it hasn't been reduced yet to reflect the new ask or the revised motion at 3.52. For you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, uh, at our budget GIC schedule for tomorrow, we'll provide an update with respect to the the uh, Hamilton Police Services Board approved 3.71, which would translate into a further reduction of about a quarter million dollars, and we will provide an update with respect to the motion and the reference to a 3.52% uh, increase and what that would translate into in terms of an impact on our draft 2013 budget. And just using the math that you had just used to get us from the 3.9 to 3.71, it looks like taking us to the 3.52 almost takes us to uh, about a half a million dollars in additional savings at the city. Is that safe to assume? Through uh, you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, the 3.52 translates into uh, approximately $140.4 million. Uh, and again, we are reflecting or have reflected to date 3.9%, which translates into $140.9 million. So the council is correct. The difference would represent a reduction of approximately half a million dollars. Okay. And because we have some board members here and, and some of the staff who will be key to making the, the budget decisions, I just want to make sure that um, maybe Mr. Zagarek can recap for us the direction that we've given our own staff in terms of, uh, as you know, Mr. Chairman, this council has been fairly resolute in trying to get us to as close to a zero as we can through four consecutive budget processes. This is budget number three. And I think we've been the top th in the top three in all of Ontario for the first two. I believe that taking us to something lower than what we're at now. If we get below 1.9, I think we're second to London, if memory serves me right, from the last presentation that we received. Right. So for you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, in terms of our comparator group, we are second lowest uh, at approximately 1.9%. That's great. So I, I, I just want to confirm uh, through you that uh, that's our goal and objective, and certainly we'll, the same will hold true next year. And any additional expenses, um, that we carry over to 2014 will make that same goal and objective all that much more difficult to achieve. So I just wanted uh, to hear Mr. Zagarek uh, reiterate that, and I'm, I'm, I'm uh, pleased with the answer, and um, those are the only questions I have at this point in time. Thank you. Councillor Deval, second time question. Thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, through you to the deputy, one of the question. deputy chiefs, um, as we've heard the, uh, the numbers float around of what... Uh, could be a possible budget um, if we can agree on uh, this council. Uh, I've heard from the chair, um, even if uh, with, without 20 officers, it was 3.33. That's what the, the chair has said in, in her letter. Uh, the percentage is 3.33 with the 20 officers removed. However, in the chief's letter dated yesterday, he has been very, very clear, even if he didn't get the 3.71 and council established another number and he used 3.62, he was very clear that they intend to approve the hiring of 21 officers. So my question I, I, through you, Mr. Chair, is even if it was set at 3.52, is it still the, uh, is it still the intent for the police service board to hire the 21 officers. Okay. Through you, Deputy Mayor, it certainly is the number one priority for our service is to hire the 20 officers. Whatever this, the council decides to set the budget at, the board would have to review that uh, budget and then decide on the next actions that would take place, including the hiring of the 20 officers. Okay. I think that answers. Although Thank we you. already got clarity in a previous question that if we pass the resolution as recorded in the minutes of March 21st, it does not include the 20 new officers or one new civilian in the budget. Yeah, that, that's not what I'm hearing. No, it doesn't matter. Well, Mr. Chair, what I'm, all I'm hearing is it doesn't matter what we set this number at. The board will then take another look at it. Their priority is to hire 21 officers, no matter what the rate is. That's what I'm hearing. Okay, but that okay. won't be our message back to them if we pass this resolution. Okay, thank okay. you. Okay. 
and now I was going to open up to comments now, but I guess, Councilor Whitehead, you have a question? Then you can go right into your comment because you're first up for comments, and Councilor Clark. Yeah, I just, uh, clarification. <laughs> um, in many of the presentations to the community and certainly to the board, uh, and I'm going to set the crime index or the violent crime index aside, on youth crime and all those other fronts, uh, the numbers are dropping. Is that correct through the chair? Crime is going down, but our city's growth continues. We have 34,000 additional officers. There's new provincial uh, hours of uh, 34,000 additional hours of work. Between 2009 and 2012, there was an additional 1,000 arrests done by our service. That includes court costs and everything else. There is uh, additional provincial downloading and federal loading that uh, downloading that happens all the time. And we're, basically we're talking about investing in policing, community-based policing, the proactive approach, youth crime trends, crime prevention. So it, it all depends. Um, crime is going down, but it's still our job and the, uh, and the job of the police service board to ensure that there is adequate and effective police service in our community. Appreciate that. Um, are we expecting any dramatic changes in provincial federal legislation uh, next year? Uh, that's going to have any impact on the decision that we're making today in regards to resources? At this time, we don't expect it. However, we have seen trends such as human trafficking, uh, other downloadings that have, that have happened where the province says you will uh, respond to that. Uh, I think of the example of the sexual offender, offender registry. That was downloaded on the service and we had to respond to it and without any additional funding from the province or the federal government. Now, is it, uh, uh, it's my understanding that, uh, what, 700, how many officers do we have? Uh, uniformed? Eight, 830 officers sworn. 830 out. officers. Uh, we've heard that crime is going uh, down in many areas. Can I ask this question, because uh, Bob uh, was so kind to uh, focus on what is the, un uh, Mayor Bob uh, was uh, focusing on what is seen as unpalatable by many of the communities and quite, quite frankly disgusting and need enforcement. So I just want to focus on that so-called spin. Do we not have the resources uh, operationally where we ha see an uh, 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 increase in certain areas of crime to move officers to those areas? Is that a flexibility that we have within the service? From one area that's maybe dropping low to an area that you see an increase, is that flexibility there? The flexibility is always there. However, when you pull from one area, another area actually suffers. As you know, and it's been told at the Police Services Board, we have hundreds of fraud investigations that have not been looked at. We have extreme workloads in our sexual assault and child abuse branch. We have one person looking after all the sex offenders uh, in our community. So yes, when we have a protest or we have a major incident or we have a homicide where we have to put numerous officers on, officers on those cases, uh, we have the flexibility of moving the officers. But that does not mean that other areas do not suffer because of that. And to be clear, uh, the officers that we have per 100,000 is around 154? 153, that's Per 100,000? Yes. So uh, Edmonton, Calgary, Vancouver, uh, I think Winnipeg, Durham, York, London are either below or equal to that, that number? That is correct. Our provincial average of policing per 100,000 is 198. We're at 153. And I think you, you can't not look at the crime severity of our community, which is over 90%. Okay, which is close to uh, Windsor, is that correct? I believe so, and I think Windsor have uh, about 240 officers per 100,000. And they came in at 0% in their budget last year? That would be great if uh, you brought us up to that level. Again, if similar to Toronto at 201, that would be 300 officers. So if we were at the same level, you're probably looking at uh, a much greater number. They came in at zero again this year? Windsor's crime severity rate is 76, where Hamilton is actually at uh, somewhere around 93, I believe. And yes, they did come in at zero. Again, they're starting with a, a much bigger bucket than us. Thank you. On my comments? Yeah, I j I've just been speaking to the clerk about procedure here, and it's been suggested that we should hold back the comment section until tomorrow's 
budget debate when this will be lifted. And it, uh, or, you know, the clerk uh, says it's not the right thing to do. We could, in fact, lift it up today and vote on it today. But, Let's do that. But her preference is, is the preference of the clerk's office, and rightly so, is to do it tomorrow as part of a budget meeting. This is a regular GIC meeting. And, and I don't see any particular problem with deferring it until tomorrow. But I'm at the mercy of committee what you want to do. Anything to add on that, to Madam Clerk? Um, through the chair, the, the police service budget is part of the entire boards and agencies report, which is before the GIC budget meetings. And at the budget meetings, that portion has been deferred. Um, if the police service budget is approved here at GIC today, that specific recommendation will not go to council um, within this meeting's report, but it will be, be carried over to the budget report where all of the entire city's budget is approved. So as our clerk, is your preference we do it tomorrow? It's my advice. It's your advice to do it tomorrow. It is my advice. And I don't see any particular problem with deferring. However, leaving until tomorrow, it's a regular agenda item. We just don't hear any comments today. That's fine. It was, the purpose of today was to ask questions. I have nobody wanting to ask any more questions. So at the, at, at the, uh, at, okay, get a point of order, Councilor Clark. And I'll come to you, Councilor McKay. To be clear, we have done this before in the budget process, lifted a budget item in one meeting and simply moved it over. So we have done that type of thing before. It's not out of the realm of possibility. Um, I, I was prepared and thought we were doing it today. I'm prepared to make comments today, and I wanted the police to hear the comments. If we do it tomorrow, then the police officers and the police services board, they're not necessarily going to hear anything we say. And so we've already been operating in a vacuum for months now. I'd rather them actually hear what the councillors are saying. Quite frankly, I think I'd like to put it to a vote then and get the, the, the will of committee. Um, procedurally, the council, your advice is to take us to tomorrow so the budget stays together. But I hear some committee members who would like to do it today. So um, I, I, would, I would entertain, okay, you move a motion that we uh, lift this and, and, and uh, debate it and vote on it today. Is there a seconder to that? Councillor Partridge, discussion on the motion. Seeing none, all in favor? Yes. Opposed? Okay, the motion carries. So, um, well, I think we need to put the motion first and then we'll open it up to comments. Is Bernie gonna make the motion? Here's, here's the motion uh, from uh, last Remember, week. Who's seconding it? I'll move it. And seconded by Marula. Where? Oh, wait a minute. Get on the table. Whereas the Council of the City of Helm recognizes the community's ability to pay as a guiding budget principle through 2010 to 2014 term of office, and whereas there is a growing concern with the current economic climate for the fiscal challenges that face our city, and whereas Council has established during this term of office, a budget target of as close to a 0% increase as possible with boards, agencies, internal departments, and all emergency service divisions, and whereas Council firmly believes that the Hamilton Police Service has consistently proven its ability to address the public safety needs of our residents and businesses, and whereas Council believes that the maintenance of a current level of police service has proven to be very successful and responsive to the needs of the Hamilton community, and whereas Council does not support the Police Service Board request of 3.71% as it includes 20 new officers representing a 0.38% of the 2013 budget request with an additional 0.75% uh, budget pressure in 2014 and the unsustainable use of reserves representing 0.18% of the 2013 budget request and whereas a 3.52 increase will provide a sustainable and affordable budget that assumes no reduction in complement and service, therefore it be resolved that the City of Hamilton supports a 2013 Hamilton Police Service budget of 140,000, I'm $140,414,620, representing a 3.52% increase over the 2012 approved budget. Mr. Chairman, okay. motion. And, um, 
Okay, so I'll open it up for discussion now. And so far in the speaker's list, I have Councillor Whitehead, Councillor Clark, Councillor McCaddy, Councillor Marula, and Councillor Pearson. Those are the speaker's list so far. So, Councillor Whitehead. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor. I, uh, the first thing I want to say again, and I, we need to re uh, always reiterate it, I, I believe that our frontline officers and, and, and management are, are, are second to none in this community in providing uh, safety and, uh, and services. So uh, uh, I want to make sure that that's pointed because obviously when you start dealing with budgets, that always gets spun that uh, you're anti-police. I'm certainly not anti-police. I think we got some of the best in the country. The issue for me, quite frankly, uh, Mr. Chair, is uh, uh, the police budget, and it's not just happening in Hamilton, so I, I want to make it clear. I, uh, I've, we're at SCM and we're hearing it right across the country. Uh, Ontario, the police services, uh, the police officers are the highest paid in the world. Uh, I think we had 33% of the officers on the sunshine list. Uh, that's an issue in itself. Uh, the other reality is, is that our police budget back in 2000 was $80, 000, uh, $80 million. Today is $140 million, almost double. It's not sustainable. And I can tell you that the ministry is taking notice of the pushback this community uh, has provided. And I, I want to make this clear. The ministry, the provincial government, has taken notice on the pushback. And, uh, and this is a milestone because you don't often see community jumping on board. Police has always been motherhood because of the great services and reliable services they provide our community. But what's transpired in the, in the last year uh, and through the polls and the phone calls and emails, and, and I want to highlight, and that's why I asked the question in the report, willing to pay. That's an important element. And each one of us were elected in our own prospective wards representing those interests. Not the appointed board members. We are. We hear from our constituencies every day on almost every issue. And certainly taxes is one of those issues that come back every day from our constituents, control the increases, control the increases. We know that we have one of the highest senior populations in the community, or in, uh, in Ontario per capita. We also know that we have an affordability issue. One of the highest issues in Hamilton is the affordability issue. So we cannot be uh, compared to Mississauga and Peel and Durham and York when you talk about people's ability to pay. So when you take all these things into consideration, if you look at your police services budget since 2008, it increased by 20.3%. When this council was elected, in one of the, the happiest moments, we were all on the same page. Let's push for a sustainable zero. Let's get close to that zero as possible. And we provided direction to our general managers to try and do their best to get that number down. And every year, our general managers, for the most part, have delivered some cases even below. And the question often asked in, asked in the community is if your general managers are put under this, in this target to meet those targets, get those numbers down, why are police services treated differently? Because over that same time frame, you need to understand that the police services have never, ever, ever met those targets. But there's something happening in this community. And I think that's part of the education. And people start recognizing that it's time to push back and understand that you, it is not an open pit when you go to the taxpayer. And when you talk about a report that says willing to pay, I would hope, I would hope that the board members and, and the appointed board, and this is targeted to the bo appointed board members, I would hope they would listen because they need to understand that we get the calls. We're the ones held accountable every four years. And we're certainly hearing from the community that it's time to control the police ask. So when I take a look at uh, uh, the, uh, the reports with crime going down and understanding that uh, operational decisions, there's still uh, flexibility within their own service report that which it identifies they can do that. Uh, when I understand that they took 20 officers or 24 officers from other locations and put it into one particular team and their own report, it identifies that they have the flexibility to move those officers around to needed areas. And it's pretty clear to me that there's some capacity within the police services. 
And, it's not, and I'm saddened by the fact that it seems that there's a line being drawn in the sand. And, and this is the, I've never seen this before. We've never had a situation where, and I think Councillor Jackson put it best uh, a number of meetings ago, when he said, look, would you consider five officers just looking to see if we can get some movement? There has been absolutely zero, zero movement. And let's understand this, the original budget was 5.25%. Now they whittled it down to 3.71, but you, the, part of the reason for that is because, one of the reasons is because the officers they wanted to hire, they couldn't hire sooner because the school, the school wasn't available. So they couldn't hire them to the latter part of the year. So by supporting the 3.71 ask, you're in fact, we're in essence, supporting the 5.25 because the balance of that would have been deferred to the, the next, uh, next budget. So it was a bit of a shell game. To support 3.71, you're supporting 5.25. Let's no, there's no kidding around here. So when I look at the 3.62, and I'm hearing uh, clearly that uh, even with the 3.62, uh, uh, they're, they're determined to, uh, to, to, to hire 21 officers that we know is going to come back and bite us next year on the budget, that concerns me. But the problem is, is as a council, we can't make operational decisions. We can only make budget decisions. We can set targets, we can uh, send it back. That's all the options we have. So when uh, Councillor Collins puts uh, forward the 3.3 as the maintenance budget, uh, we don't want them pulling from the reserves, so that's 0.18, that comes to 3.52. So to me, that is the maintenance budget. I believe there's uh, a capacity uh, within the police services, and I have every confidence that this chief can deliver. He has no choice, that's the position we put him in. He has, he has the where for all, he has the capacity, and I hope, and I know that uh, this board, because we have some very good representatives on the board, will listen to the comments we make around this table today and hopefully understand uh, the affordability issue in this community and take that under consideration when this motion is passed. I'm hoping that's the case. So I will be uh, absolutely supporting what's before us and I just hope that the chief and the board recognizes uh, the challenges and listens carefully to uh, this debate. Thank you. Councillor Clark. Um, thank you. Uh, Deputy Mayor, um, first I, I would like to start off and, and to thank um, uh, the Chief's Office and um, the Police Services Board for the provision of, of data. I didn't get everything that I asked for, but I got probably 98% of what I asked for, which um, is in itself a, a historic feat uh, in the city of Hamilton for the police services because the budget was always this clandestine process that we didn't know anything about. They went behind closed doors and that's where they made that decision. They came out and gave you the number. Um, this time it was different. The, you know, I, I actually had a budget so that I, I quite clearly saw the budgets as that were presented for each division and for IDENT and everything. It was all there except for the actual numbers. <laughs> that were expended and, and that's the one challenge that, that I had. So I do want to, I, I do want to thank for, you, you, you're coming, you've come a long way from where it was. We have to finish the job though. And I can't underscore enough for me um, what it means to me to have the expenditure figures included in a budget. budget. Um, we go over these community groups that come in and, and it's the expenditure numbers that tell us exactly what's going on. We can understand very clearly um, the life of any organization. When I was taught how to assess, you know, um, financial statements, that was a part of the process. You needed to see the expenditures and you clearly understood right then and there um, and it pointed to patterns, it pointed to is issues that may be for you, uh, but when you're dealing with a budget, it gave you the very clear um, picture of where they were going. So what I'm left with right now is a budget with no expenditures marked in it, and I'm being provided a number of percent percentages of increase for the budget, 
but I really don't know what the 3.5, 3.6, 3.712, 1.18 1 is going to reflect in, over, in the overall budget. If I were to take 3.5% and add it to every single line item on the budget, that would be a significant overall increase to the budget, really significant. So I can't tell by the documents that are before me whether or not the calculations that are being utilized are truly a maintenance budget or not. Uh, I wish I could, but I honestly can't. Um, and that is the quagmire that I now find myself in. Um, I've talked to a lot of my residents, so especially over the Easter weekend, about it. And without a doubt, every single one of them was struck by the fact that I didn't have the actual expenditures listed in the budget. How can, how can you do your job without knowing those numbers? How do they, and I understand we simply approve the budget, reject the budget, or give them a figure back. But it would be helpful if we had the actual expenditures so we knew what figure to give back. I can't do it. So I'm still caught in, in, in that quandary and without those numbers, and I, heard the reason that was provided to me that the reason they wouldn't provide those figures is that it was in a collective bargaining process and they didn't want to in essence tip off the association in terms of what money is 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 around my initial reaction to that was yes that's a val valid position to take but then i'd also dawned on me we do it frequently we will pass our budget as does the province as does the feds, line by line, in the middle of collective bargaining. Because we're a transparent democratic government. So what's the difference here? Why couldn't I see those numbers so that I could verify the calculations? So um, that's my frustration, and for that sole reason, um, I will not be supporting the motion that is before us today. Uh, hopefully next year I'll actually get to see everything. Thank you. Councillor McCaddy. Thanks uh, <clears throat> very much, Mr. Deputy Mayor, and uh, I will be supporting the uh, motion before us, uh, and I'd like to uh, reflect on my rationale for doing so. Uh, to begin with, I'll, I'll just again thank the, uh, the police for, uh, for uh, being here today and, and at the previous meetings, and just generally for the great work they do uh, across our city. They, they certainly do great work in Ward 1, I know downtown and elsewhere. So that's, that's the overriding uh, comment. But I, I just, um, just in reflecting on the, uh, the letter that was sent, uh, I guess, uh, yesterday to us uh, from the Police Services Board, uh, or uh, from the Chief of Police, it, um, it, I guess it makes sense from a police perspective, this, the perspective contained in this letter and the, probably the Police Services Board, they're, uh, quite rightly uh, focused on, on their particular service, uh, which is uh, one of many services that, that we deal with as a city council right across uh, the city, looking at all the different departments at uh, the city of Hamilton and of course all the boards and agencies and other things that we deal with in our larger uh, budget uh, discussions. Uh, and I was just struck by, by some of the language used in here and how we could in fact use the same language uh, as we think about other challenges we have here in the city and, and funding required for those. It, the, the letter speaks to the five pillars of public safety that the, uh, the police service has, has built into their system. Uh, and you know, we, we could easily talk about the five pillars of, uh, of community uh, uh, good functioning that, that we uh, work on here at the city. Uh, I would say the number one uh, for me would be housing. Uh, both maintaining the housing that's out there. We've talked about the maintenance requirements for affordable housing and building new housing and reflecting on the housing wait list that we have, some five, 6,000 people uh, who, uh, you know, in the language that we were dealing with today in the police uh, world, we would perhaps call them victims. And victims of how society functions and uh, victims of not, uh, for, for whatever reason, not having enough income or being in the, the right family situation or, or any number of other things that could occur, mental health challenges, uh, they find themselves as victims. 
and uh, don't have proper housing. They're on the uh, affordable housing wait list that we have. So that would be pillar one that, that we work with. Uh, the second pillar might be food security, uh, where we work with, in our case, with the food banks and uh, we contribute funding uh, for, uh, for food security. We have a food security committee at the city who try to proactively come up with alternatives on that. Uh, the third, I'll go through these quickly, Mr. Chair, because I don't want to go into detail on every one of these. And I've just listed these this morning as I was listening. The third one might be early years programs. We know the importance of the zero to six uh, years of age period uh, for children. Uh, and we're about uh, making Hamilton the best place to raise a child. So we have programs sir, that are important in that area. The fourth might be income supports and, uh, and supplements where we, uh, we work with uh, the OWODSP program. Uh, we've got uh, various other supplements that assist people, the low income bus pass, uh, which we'll uh, touch on later. And the last, uh, for, for lack of uh, time, I've simply listed as parks and recreation programming, uh, where that's also very important to uh, people here in Hamilton. Uh, and uh, you know, keeping the kids off the street and all kinds of other things that, that parks and rec programming does. So I think I only outlined those, uh, those five or as five pillars that we might uh, say we work with uh, to say that, that we, uh, beyond the Police Services Board and the, and the Hamilton Police, we need to deal with a whole variety of other challenges that also, I would suggest, uh, affect crime rates uh, and uh, how our, our neighborhoods function, how people function here in Hamilton. And it's, it talks also in the letter about... Um, you know, using uh, benchmarking and tools and, you know, we've got the social determinants of health that we work with and we, we have benchmarking we work with on these programs that I've talked about. Uh, and we're in, in some cases not up, to, not up to snuff on those uh, programs. In terms of benchmarking, we ideally need to put more money into those programs to, to, to do well. And I think if, if every city department used the approach that's being used here by the police, they talk about... Uh, and, uh, and the ratio of officers to population, so the ratio of housing units to population, in our case, uh, population growth, uh, crime severity index measurements, uh, so the, the index of, uh, of, of poverty uh, impacts that we see through our work, uh, we would come to the same conclusion as they've come to, that we need uh, more money. Every department in the city needs three, four, five, six, seven percent increases. But uh, we, don't, uh, we don't have... Mr. Mr. Deputy Mayor, we don't have the luxury of doing that. Uh, we uh, also have the mandate to keep our, our taxes at a uh, supportable level. That's been touched on by other speakers. Uh, and we need to serve all those masters, all those different interests. Uh, the police budget and crime issues in Hamilton being one of those. Uh, but we have many other interests as well. So we, in, in reflecting on those, it's important that we keep to uh, a sustainable budget in the police to go along with the other challenges that we have. Um, so that's why I'm supporting the, uh, the motion before us. Okay, thank you. Councilor Marula. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor. And let me start off by saying that uh, I proudly stand by the Hamilton Police uh, Services Association and the thousand members um, who have clearly supported the motion that's uh, before us now. Um, in no way is this an anti-police. If anything, it's really about protecting the front line and what they believe. And, and I'd like to empower them. And as a result, we're supporting something that they've asked us to support and, has, and they've publicly endorsed. And in, in saying that I'm proudly standing by those thousand uh, officers, nearly thousand officers, um, I, I, I say that I, I do that with a great deal of respect and, and pride. And as I said in the past, I've never not supported a request from the Hamilton Police Services in 13 years. And I didn't anticipate doing that this year until we got into a tug of war for no other reason but for a tug of war. And I think that is what is really the saddening component. The other component that I'm really pleased about is that this has become a catalyst uh, to the fact that the governance process in Ontario, as it pertains to not only downloading file, but policing, is broken. We're not accountable as a council. And clearly, the vast majority of, of, the, of the public, when we, when we tax them, on average, $3,000, uh, if we were to tell them that 1,200 of that 3,000 has nothing to do with 
any decision that we make here at council, but basically that of powers greater than us, and that being the province, because we are a creature of the province, and this legislation that provides the governance for police with, with provincial appointees, uh, really is no different in the impact because they're both downloading and both really abusive in nature as a direct result of our relationship and the legislation that allows for this to foster. So I'm, using, I'm glad that this is occurring for one thing, for public awareness about the fact that nearly half of our operating budget is out of our control, which begs the question or raises the question, how can we fix it? So I'm using this example as a means of changing this particular problem in the future. And I thank Councillor Clark because he mentioned something that he's not supporting this motion because he doesn't have enough information. Well, frankly, that's why we need to change it. Because if, if, we, if we were accountable, if this body actually had some sort of teeth to making a decision, then, then frankly, we wouldn't be in this position, as Councillor Clark stated. So let's use this as not only as a, as a means or a catalyst to, to create awareness about how broken the governance process is, but let's move on making those necessary changes. And I will be bringing forward a motion. I need to speak with staff and people at Queen's Park in order to uh, formulate in a manner that's conducive uh, uh, to move this uh, forward, to change this broken governance system that's unaccountable, unelected, and frankly, unacceptable. And I, again, emphasize how I stand by the thousand members of the police association who really are the bread and butter of the Hamilton Police services and who I stand proudly by. And I frankly am disappointed, as I said in the past, but I am proud of, of uh, the two elected officials that understand the need, uh, Councilor Morelli and Councilor Whitehead, who understand that account accountability in elected office is important, that understand standing up when you see something wrong to try to change it is important, and to understand that we, hire, we are here to serve the public and not to participate in a tug-of-war for the sport of a tug-of-war. And that's the saddening component to all of this. Let's remember why we're all here. We're all here for the taxpayer. The system is broken. We need to fix it. But we need elected officials who stand up on behalf of the residents and not become a rubber stamp. And that, I, need, I truly need to be noted. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Mayor. You're welcome. Um, Councilor Pearson. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, and uh, certainly to the colleagues around the table have spoken. Um, I know, I think we all, and I, and I want to concur that I certainly stand by not only the chief, our deputies here today, police association, the police association members, and the board. I think they work very hard. It's not an easy job, and um, and I know when uh, the calls go out for 911, we want to be sure that the response service is there. I am also pleased to read, uh, just reading over the chief's letter, that the Hamilton Police Service is absolutely committed to the delivery of excellence in policing at the budget approved by the board and or established by council. So I'm pleased to see that he stands by what um, he's directed to do as far as serving this city. And uh, I'm sure and confident he will come in with what, uh, what is being requested. I also want to just add on the table, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, that reading letters, we knew going into this budget also that, yes, this is a maintenance budget, and just for the public's information, most of the items, even in our own, all the other departments, these are budget items that are out of the control of, of our staff and our, to come back and say we can reduce these. These are OMERS, these are benefits, um, pensions, et cetera, that we have no control over, and we know all of our departments have been coming in with the same messages that these are costs that they cannot eliminate and we have to pay them. So that's 2.78% of the chief's budget is just that. So I just wanted to be sure that that's on the table, um, that we understand that. Um, I stand by the motion that's before us today. I think by reading the chief's comments in his letter um, that we can move forward. I'm confident we will continue to have the services in this city. And um, I do know that, uh, obviously, I asked the question, even at 3.33, does the chief intend on hiring 20 plus one civilian? And that may come about. So uh, we'll have to see what happens. I guess my question to that, if I could ask a question after all of this, Mr. Deputy Mayor, is what does happen? Because I've never been in a situation where the chief may go to the... Um, 
um, the Ontario uh, um, Commission, uh, Police Commission, for a, a deliberation. What does happen if it comes back and there's a change? Can I ask that through you to, you know, Mike's not here, but Mike maybe one of the deputies. the right guy to answer that. To uh, maybe one of the deputies can answer. Like, what happens to the budget at that point? Okay. If the matter is sent to OCOPS on behalf of the board, the OCOPS will make a decision and they'll determine uh, what either the budget is or the issue today is about officers. Uh, they may come back and say the officers are needed or they may say more officers are needed. Uh, at that time, they'll come back and the budget will be set by the province of Ontario. And once it's set, then I assume it would have to come back to us. And I'm sorry, Mike's not here. We can ask that question later. That it would have to come back to us for deliberation. Is that correct, or is there no. well dollars? I, I think it, I think it goes to OCOPS, and that decision is final. That, that decision, decision is final. But we'd have to find the money. Correct. Yeah. Thank you. And, and that decision has has not been made by the police no, no. services Understood. board yet. Understood. Just yeah. putting it out there that that's the process, and I appreciate that. But I do uh, stand by this motion today. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, Councillor Collins. Thanks, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, and I. You know, anyone, anyone associated with uh, public service uh, at any level of government quickly realizes when you're a part of it that your uh, salaries and wages drive your budgets. That is primarily the largest chunk of any public sectors, uh, any public organization's uh, global budget. The largest driver in cost is your uh, wage component. And so it came as no surprise to, I think, most of us when we witnessed the downturn in the economy in 2008 into 2009 when it hit hardest, that in fact we were forced, uh, like other organizations, not just in the province but across Canada, to switch gears pretty quick and try to find a um, ways and means in which to stem the tide of the budget increases that we've seen in, in past years. And uh, we were su fairly successful so far in doing that. And I recapped earlier the successes that we've had over the first two budget sessions and uh, you know it's ironic today that if you look at um, 8.2 on the agenda which is an information report it it gives us a good summary of the wage increases that we've seen uh, associated with our own organization what the comparators are across the uh, across the province but it also provides a snapshot of where we've been with some of our uh, our unions and some of our boards and agencies and if you uh, turn to the uh, when we deal with 8.2 mr. chairman You'll note that from the years 2009 to 2012, the wage increases for our management here at the city, again, I want to remind everyone, the largest driver of our budgets are employee-related costs. The, the wage increases for our own management, management um, staff through those very difficult years were 3.4 percent. For our, um, our uh, unionized employees, I believe it's uh, just under 5. And for the police, um, in that same time period, they're 12 percent. And so I think there were a number of speakers earlier who talked about the rising cost of police services. And what's, what can council do as, as one stakeholder, it seems like we're a stakeholder in that process, um, what can we do to try uh, and um, ensure that we're responding to the, the problems, the economic problems that we've experienced over the last number of years? And, and I can say with, with confidence and great certainty that the, the vast majority of people around this table have bought into... Um, getting as close to zero through the budget process as possible, at least through the thir first three budgets, the vast majority. Not unanimous. And I can say with great certainty that um, the vast majority of our bureaucracy has bought into the fact that we need to get as close to zero as possible through all budgets. And the vast majority of our um, boards and agencies have bought into the fact that we have some economic challenges ahead of us and they bought into the fact that we need to get to as close to zero as possible. And it's not a race to the bottom. It's not about cutting services and slashing and burning as we've seen other governments do in the past. It's about trying to find ways and means in which to provide the same services or better in some cases um, with less resources than we may have had and, and less COLA increases than we might have experienced in the past. And so I want to commend everyone who's been a part of that. It's been, it's been a success. We know that despite our record building numbers that we've seen and again we just heard yesterday at planning that we're experiencing record growth again in 2013 we're two and a half percent ahead of where we were last year at this point in time as it relates to building permits but that's all for naught if Hamilton can't in some shape or form address its uncompetitive tax rate and so we can let that happen and we can we can you know we can win awards based on that and that's all well and good we've worked hard for that 
But if you allow your tax rate to, uh, to continue to be uncompetitive, and, and, um, and certainly we've heard that in certain sectors, uh, then, um, then it's all for naught. And so if, this is part of that big puzzle. It's part of a big plan. And I'm glad that uh, the Police Service Board representatives are here today to hear some of the challenges that we face. And newspapers, and they're probably listening to some of the same uh, radio stations that we are, and, and, um, and they're on the web. And, um, and so it's important to understand that this is part of, of a, a big plan, a bigger plan that we have. And, and there's sort of a method to the madness, if you want to call it that. And I, I don't think it helps anyone um, to see some of the saber rattling that we've seen over the last several weeks or several months. It certainly does uh, very little for morale. And, um, and I just hope that when we pass this budget, the board will find a way to help us with the challenges that we have and uh, find a way to make the service uh, and deliver the service as they have in the past. As the motion um, mentions in, from Councillor Morelli, um, we've had terrific policing service in this community for the last, uh, well, for decades. And, um, and we're, we've been a part of that. We've supported the service. Uh, but I think that the, the organization just needs to be aware of the economic challenges that face us at this point in time in the city's history. And somehow we need to find a way to work together rather than rattling those sabers, which uh, for whatever reason has been the case over the last several months. So those are my comments. I hope uh, most will see fit to, to pass what we have today. And I look forward to a positive response from the, uh, the Hamilton Police Service Board and their staff. Uh, next is Mayor Pertino. So, thanks, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor. We, I think everyone agrees around the table, we have had outstanding performance by the Hamilton Police Service, uh, and especially since the uh, appointment of Chief DeCare. So the heat of the current debate is really, the heat comes on the level of compensation, but the, the police budget is about the level of service. And that's why I referred to in my question earlier on the, the level of victimization. And we know by the numbers that we need to do more to provide the adequate and efficient level of policing. The United Nations did the analysis. And the median around the world of police officers per 100,000 is 300. The United Nations recommends a minimum police strength of 222 per 100,000 or one, one officer for about every 450 people. That's from the UN. Currently Hamilton is about one for every 651. Hamilton, as we've heard, 153 officers per 100,000. Canada, 202 is the average across the country. In the United States, it's 256. In Germany, it's 298. In Hong Kong, 393. The Netherlands, 328. Italy has 417. And Spain has 511 officers per 100,000. That's the average. I've got the floor, Councillor. So, once again, I would be happy to move the motion that we freeze the police budget as Toronto did, at the Toronto rate of service delivery, including uh, officers per 100,000. And you've heard the number. It'll cost us. The question arises about, or the statement is made, Mr. Deputy Mayor, about the biggest portion of our budget is the police. Well, guess what the number one response is? In our surveys, the previous mayor did a survey, Michael Marini did a survey, and the number one issue for residents is policing and safety. So that's where the public says policing should be positioned, based on their, the surveys that we've done with our public. In 2011, council decided to increase tax rates for the new areas of the city. Council also decided to keep tax levels in the old city the same. This is the uh, area rating reinvestment plan. So had savings from area rating been built into tax rates, the old city would have had a 0.3 increase. But council, and I voted for it because I thought it was a good thing, I supported it. Let's keep the tax level in the old city the same, which meant a $20 increase per taxpayer in the old city. 
I supported that. The arguments were made. I believed in those arguments. And we have to consider, for instance, the enhancement that has been asked for in the current budget by the wards. The enhancement is 500, over $500,000, and on, on the, uh, the ward budget, that is, it makes a total increase of 16%. I supported that. We re heard from our colleagues that they required a higher level of service to see that the public was properly served because I believe and I trust in my colleagues. I'm not sure why we don't believe and trust in the Chief of Police of Hamilton, his senior officers, and my colleagues on the, on the Police Service Board. We heard that the police budget since 2008 has gone up, what, 20%? 2008, the ward budgets went up 3.9%, Last year, the ward budgets went up 10%. And as I said, we have, if you work the enhancement out, and I'll, you can ask Mike Zagarek, because I asked Mike, is, is this what this means in terms of percentage? So, we, if we're so desperate for dollars, we could have made other adjustments. We could have made other adjustments to... We heard about terrible comments about our police services board. This was a statement that was made that you people traditionally in the public sector, you could always go back to the good old tax trough and ask for more money because appointed members of the board. Well, guess who are we, who we are? We're public sector. We're at the tax trough. We're taking more money from the public's pocket. We had a very outstanding appointee to the Police Services Board that you appointed, and his name was Jim Kay. And Jim Kay supported myself and the other members who supported the Chief's budget. At the end of that very heated meeting, one of our fellow councillors leaned across to Jim Kay, and the reason I'm telling you this is this was published. I would not do hearsay or talk out of class. This is what was published. That's the last time you'll sit here. And at the next meeting, Jim Kay resigned. And Jim Kay asked that he not say anything public about his resignation, but he would like to speak to individual counselors. I don't know who's called Jim to talk to him. But this is the emotional level that this very important process, the police establishing the police budget, has gone to. And so my colleagues, I, I'm sure that the Chief to Care's budget is going to be turned down. The arguments are all about the compensation levels, not about the service levels. And the Chief, in his professional opinion, feels that what he has put forward is what he feels in his professional opinion is what is required to provide adequate and efficient policing. And you and we as a council, if we turn that down, are saying policing is, at, the victimization in Hamilton is adequate. The one per hundred abuse cases and the abuse cases are rising and all of the other stuff that you've heard. That's fine with this council because of the attitude that this is an argument not about the service level that's being provided by our police service, but the compensation. That's another argument. Mr. Deputy Mayor, we're making, and our AMO representatives and our FCM representatives will know that that coordinated bargaining will be taking place, or at least has been proposed, to address the very high levels of police compensation. But that's not what this is about today. What this is about today is the adequate and efficient provision of security and safety to our citizens, and I support the Chief's budget. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Farr. I support what's before.
course, here in the form of this motion, and I think today's debate and recent correspondence, Mr. Deputy Mayor, uh, from Hamilton Police Services and from uh, the Hamilton Police Services uh, Board uh, gives me confidence to do so. I have confidence in the Hamilton Police Services uh, and their ability to make uh, this number work. And uh, I have confidence that the board, uh, with their uh, incoming a new representat representative, uh, soon to be selected, I guess, from our City of Hamilton uh, Selection Committee, uh, will work together in making this number work and work with the chief in making this work. And Mr. Deputy Mayor, in my experience working with Chief Glenn DeCare, his crime managers, and everybody in between, uh, it's been a good one. I think uh, Chief DeCare, uh, particularly, I speak obviously for downtown Hamilton and Ward 2, has proven himself both capable and uh, creative. And you can look at uh, the action, and you could look at his support and the police services support for programs, innovative programs like the Social Navigator program. And in terms of his management, and of course we've uh, recognized uh, through and through that it's, uh, it's impossible for us to get a look at uh, line by line by line uh, with respect to the Hamilton Police Services budget, but uh, I think that the Chief of Police, his management and the board are also proven capable when dealing with uh, shifting and shifts, and he has uh, obviously changed shifts in recent past, and perhaps that's an avenue that will be discussed. I can't predict it, but uh, that's something that uh, can be taken into account and debated in uh, respect with working with the, the 3.52. Um, I believe in the chief, I believe in his staff, and I believe in the board, and I think they're going to find a way uh, to make it work, and they're going to focus on those areas, and we've heard of one, obviously, repeatedly today, that uh, need more attention and perhaps draw resources away from areas that, uh, that they are able to do just that, draw resources away and support those areas that obviously uh, need attention. The uh, board knows more about those things than I do. I'm not on the Hamilton and police services board and so does the chief and his management and I want to thank them all for attending here today and for answering and addressing this uh, issue this outstanding issue as it relates to our 2013 budgetary process and uh, again very supportive of uh, the motion before us okay I'll just run through the speakers list that's left uh, these are first time speakers powers Partridge and Devell uh, and Johnson and second time speakers, which I hope we'll keep it short because I think we know where this is going, is Collins, Maruda, Clark, McCaddy, and Whitehead. So we've got a long way to go yet. So Councillor Powers. Thank you. I'll be, I'll be very brief. Um, in response to Councillor Maruda's comments about uh, Sam, I'm talking to you. In response to the, the issue of policing and the appropriate provision of policing is an issue in all municipalities in the province of Ontario and, in fact, all across Canada. Um, recently, there was a summit held uh, in, in uh, Ottawa with regards to the uh, future of policing, the increasing costs and the, uh, and, and the challenges for all municipalities, um, all provinces, territories, and the federal government was an issue that was raised. Here in Ontario, um, Emil has been invited to participate in a, uh, a workforce that's called the, uh, the Future of Policing Advisory Committee. It's been established by Minister Mayor and uh, and and is and is ongoing, and um, and very clearly the uh, the cost um, and the um, the provision of services and the cost associated with is one that's uh, there. I mean, we're lucky enough, and and I'll say this very candidly, we're lucky enough to have a municipal police force, because those municipalities who have their policing provided by OPP. Their costs are going up 8.55 percent very shortly, and uh, and they determine what the the um, the resourcing is, is is going to be, and uh, just sort this out. So one of the one of the issues that the superintendent, um, the new superintendent, has delegated to um, one of his um, sorry the commissioner has delegated. I keep losing track of titles. Has uh, has delegated to Superintendent Shilton of the OPP. Is, uh, is is a billing and, and a costing component. So they're looking at that from a from an OPP. So, um, um, Councilor Marul, I'd be pleased to provide you with the information uh, that may assist you in the development of your of your motion. Um, the second thing is obviously, and we're supportive of the position taken by um, municipalities and being in support of the interest arbitration component. Is um, we have no problems at all with where uh, in the case of policing or, or, or fire services, it goes to arbitration, and that's in the small case. The vast majority is there's an agreement reached by the bargaining units and the, um, 
and, and the, the management and respectively the council unacceptable. But in a small amount, around 10%, and they find their ways to interest arbitration. And the issue that's raised in Councillor Morelli's motion is with regards to the, the issue of affordability and the ability to respond to the condition, the fiscal health of municipalities is something that we're asking for a review. So I think that reflects upon here. Directly to the motion is my first reaction is to vote against the motion, not because I'm opposed to it, it's just because I'm opposed to the police going ahead and hiring of 20 additional people and one citizen on the basis of the decision. You know, we've instructed our staff in order to, to freeze in where we can, and we've, we've had success in rolling back on staffing of, of, of the city. Um, setting it off for a year until things are better economically for all of us would make all kinds of sense. I just can't understand the uh, the um, focus. I'm going to call it the. Um, no, I'm not going to call it. I was going to say what it was. Um, their their desire in order to increase the complement, no matter what the circumstances. So um, I think I'm going to probably support Councillor Morelli's motion, um, whereas my desire is not to support any increase at all in the police budget and let the chips fall where they are but anyway thank you councillor partridge yes thank you mr deputy mayor and um very eloquently said councillor powers and uh, i really couldn't add much to that uh, i will not be supporting this uh, motion that's that's before me and uh i mean it comes down to affordability and it comes down to at some point in time we have to push back not only can our municipality not support it, but our province can't support it. I, I just, every day I open the newspaper and I see, you know, a billion dollars at this, a billion dollars at that, 800 billion. The, the numbers are staggering that our province has to deal with. And that means our, our municipality um, has incredible challenges ahead of us as well. I have never had so many phone calls and emails from my taxpayers ranting on about this police budget. I, 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 I have been taken aback by it on how many, starting before Christmas, saying you absolutely should not stand by and approve this. I don't know what a maintenance budget is because I don't know what the expenses have been. I don't know what the costs are. I don't know what the actuals are in the budget. And I understand that's why we have a police services board. But the message loud and clear has to be, we can't afford it. And somebody, some body, some political force has to start hearing that message and do something about it. We need action. We don't need to continually hear everybody bellyache about it. We need to do something about it. So I appreciate all members of the police force that are here today and the board for coming in and presenting. I have a great deal of respect for the officers, the boots on the ground out there. We rely on them heavily for a lot of things. But the rural areas are not being serviced they are just not being serviced the way that the taxpayers expect them to be. Rightly or wrongly, that gap is there. So I will not be supporting this today. Um, I would not be supporting anything except a 0% budget. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chair. And, um I appreciate what everybody's been saying, um, and I too, my members, or my residents, have come and told me loud and clear when it was set at 5.25% that this was just not the right way to go. And uh, I've been pushed to ask for a zero. I, I've done some research and, and talked to some police officers and talked to the chief, where um, 
can we make the cuts? Uh, I want to thank Councillor Morelli and Councillor Whitehead um, for the work they've been doing on the board. And my understanding is that a maintenance budget could be acceptable. Um, we want to make sure that we still have the safety in our city. And I think what's put forward to us today would be the appropriate thing um, to ask the board to reconsider because of the affordability issue that some of our residents are talking about. I also understand that the chief has sent us a letter saying how critical and the highest priority of the additional officers that our mayor has uh, even made comments on to make sure that we have adequate safety out there um, where areas might be short of officers um, where the crime, that type of crime has increased. However, I also received a letter from the president of the Hamilton Police Association, we all did, and basically recognizing the challenges that we have as a council of trying to keep the affordable cost into our taxpayers. And he states in here that he recognizes the two legitimate needs that the chief is saying and what the, the council was saying, that the need to ensure a high level of public safety and security and the need to restrain expenditures during the period of financial difficulty as part of the corporate team of the city of Hamilton. What this president went on to say is that they're willing to sit with the chief of police and their senior staff as they went out and they spent uh, some money on doing um, and hired a consultant that they went out and asked each police officer of where they see some problems that they could be fixed by cutting down um, some waste where we all know every department has that, and they will all ask them to go back and look at where they can cut that waste. Now here we have the president of a police association putting his hand out to the senior staff and to the police chief based on the frontline officer's experience, where they see that they're top heavy in one area, and they can just deploy some officers in another area and still meet our adequate safety service that we're having that our police are giving us. So I have to take that um, in action and then look back at what the police board services is requesting and saying, okay, we believe the 20 new officers that you're requesting, or I'm looking at it saying, I understand what you're saying, that there's a need there, but the need might, you might have that need already. It's right in front of you. You just got to talk to your frontline officers, the ones that have the experience that are gold in the street, and they do that action. So that would bring it back down, and knowing that they have some collective agreements that they have to honor, and uh, being that the, uh, the payments issue, you're looking at pensions, these are costs that we all have in, in each department. And we all want 0%, but as we know as we're going forward, some departments just can't come into that. So we might see an increase in, in our taxes, we might not. But we've got to remember, too, that sometimes we keep asking for cuts, and then the cuts have to stop, because then we direct the services. So I think what's before us, uh, done by Councillor Morelli and, and Councillor Whitehead, is fair. It, 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 it's an affordable budget. It's not taking any... Uh, compliments out of the system. It's giving us the same service that we are pleased to give us, and, and I think it's fair. And, and I'm hoping that the senior staff of our police uh, department takes this message back, and I know we have a couple of counselors and, and the mayor, and take it back to the board. Tell them, explain to them the discussions we had. I think it's very important when I see this message from the police, the, the president of the police association, that they want to work with them. They see that they want to have a made in Hamilton solution. They're not asking for a province-wide solution. They're asking a made in Hamilton solution. They see our, 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 our challenges and they want to help. And I think that's pretty good. And I, and I believe that when I go back to my residents and saying the 3.52% was basically the lowest we could get without cutting your services in the police department. So I will be supporting it. Um, I'm reluctant. I wish it was down to zero. But however, um, that's what we're facing. And uh, 
we have to make a decision, and, and I will be supporting it. Thank you. Okay, and the last first-time speaker is Councillor Johnson. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, I had two community meetings that the uh, police came out to and explained to everyone what the, what the problems were in our areas and what we were working on. And they came out, did an amazing job, explained to the residents how they deploy their officers. Because the residents were saying, why don't we just have somebody specifically for a village or specifically for an area? And rightfully so, the answer was, we do not, we do not deploy officers geographically. We deploy them where the problems are. We deploy them where they're needed. And quite frankly, in your two areas, they're not needed. They're out there full time. So it's very difficult when I'm hearing through the police presentations that we need, because Bimbrook's growing, we need more police officers. And when I specifically asked, will those police officers be deployed to Bimbrook Village knowing the answer, the answer was obviously no. We don't do it geographically. Having said that, I just wanted to put this out here that I've said this and it was written in the paper and I stand behind it 180%. This is not a personal issue. This is not my critique of the police and how they're handling their job out on, on the street. They are doing amazing for, for Ward 11 residents as, as I'm hearing across the city. But what I'm hearing from our residents are enough is enough. The average salary is $48,000 per person in the city of Hamilton. So now we're asking for more money from them to pay for what we're asking not to pay for. We're asking every GM to come in with a zero increase and we're holding their feet to the fire over that increase, zero percent. So, and unfortunately the sunshine list didn't help coming out at this time of the year either. You can take that where it's coming from. But I've been consistently asking for budget cuts, and Deputy Mayor, you and I have been doing it together as, as moving those motions forward. It's finding it a little surprising this time. Everybody's coming up and going, whoa. So it's kind of nice now. We're all on the same bit, and we're all on the same uh, wavelength. I can't support what's in front of us right now for that very reason. We're asking for 0%. We don't see the budget. We can't comment on it. We can't say, yes, that's justified, that's not. So I, to this point, don't even know if 3.52 is, is the answer we need to have. So I can't support this at this time, uh, the 3.52, um, for the same reasons I'm hearing from everyone else as well. We don't have the numbers in front of us, and when we have the numbers in front of us, clear-cut numbers, line-by-line -line budgets, then we can go through it and say to my residents, this is why we're asking for the increase, period. So we have those answers. Thank you. Thank you. And Councillor Jackson, also a first-time speaker. I apologize. I thought you were second time. So the floor is yours. Not at all. Thanks, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Uh, so I won't, um, I'll try not to uh, repeat uh, a lot that's been said, Mr. Deputy Mayor. And uh, I think Councillors um, Duval and Collins, Whitehead, um, Morelli, McCaddy, and Marula have, um, have nicely summed up um, the uh, sentiment uh, where, where I'm at. And um, so I won't repeat a lot of that's been said, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Um, the, um, the chief came in in his first budget asking for a 5%, and I believe there were several extra bodies, new bodies that he asked for. And um, I believe it was in the human resource development area, and we supported it. And last year came in with basically, if I recall, was a maintenance budget, <clears throat> which I believe got unanimous support from council. And um, so here we are in this current situation. <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, I guess Mr. Mayor, um, the police association, as has been stated, um, has uh, said that they have, they want an opportunity to work um, with, the, um, with the chief and the deputies in, um, in a different manner that could, um, that could save the taxpayers some money and could provide some deployment that they feel would garner greater benefit. That's according to the president on behalf of the association. Just stating it for um, the very um, last time, Mr. Deputy Mayor, um, I just uh, love our police service. I think they're second to none. And again, having served um, and have been since on council, whether on the police board or just as a member of council, having served with the Colin Millers and the Bob Madaws and the uh, Ken Robertson's and Brian Mullins 
and now Chief DeCare. We've been um, very fortunate, but the four previous chiefs that I've been on council with and are part of the boards with in the past, we've always found a way between the police board and council to have a very productive, constructive, positive work and relationship given the fact that council is the funder on behalf of um, the taxpayers of our community. And so I'll just close, Mr. Deputy Mayor, with saying it's obvious, well, I've, watched this, um, I've watched this story unfold over the last few months. And Chief DeCare, who's entitled to his opinion, there's obviously um, an air of defiance that uh, within his heart of hearts, he, um, he has stated. Uh, Mayor Bertina, who is absolutely entitled to his opinion as well, and one of our elected reps on the board, has stated his defiance on behalf of the Chief's defiance for all the reasons that he's stated. Um, Mr. Mr. Mayor, unfortunately for me, I've observed that this is a new era in the relationship of defiance between a majority of the board, not even a unanimous um, decision of the board, and currently just a bare majority of the board, four of seven members with one municipal vacancy uh, versus council. And um, it's, not a, it's not a pleasant, um, savory, uh, favorable era of this relationship of defiance that I'm, that I'm pleased about. So, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I'll uh, conclude with basically I'm respectfully, very, very respectfully asking, I'm pleading, I'm literally borderline begging that an open-mindedness will prevail at the board table before 2013 budget is finished. I will support the motion here before us from Councillor Morelli and Whitehead. Thanks, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to put myself on as a first-time speaker, too, before I go to second time. And very briefly, I'm going to show some leadership here by being very short. I, I don't want the public to think that we're simply turning down 20 new uh, officers. Um, I just double-checked it. And since 2001, we, in fact, have added 85 new officers. So there has been an ongoing complement increase since 2001. And it was 21 or 22 when the province came out with the new program in 06 that were added. And uh, so we've gradually been increasing the complement. And secondly, you know, I've been fussing for, I think since I've been elected, that um, it was always uncomfortable with police coming in two to three times our guideline and, and, uh, uh, and then what other boards and agencies and your own departments are coming in at. So I'm prepared to support the motion today for those two reasons. So I'll take a chair back. We'll go to second time speakers. And the first is Councillor Collins. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. And again, to be very brief, Following in your leadership, I need to um, add to, there was an outstanding issue, as you recall, um, at the last meeting. There was a question as to whether or not the capital costs were included or excluded from the current number. And I think we should revise the uh, therefore uh, clause, which is the last clause in the motion. And it should read, after the $140 million reference, inclusive of capital financing costs. Moving that as a amendment. I am moving that now. It's second, second by, by Councillor by Morelli. Councillor Morelli. Okay, so to the amendment then, any comments or questions? So he's simply adding to make it clear the actual resolution that this, the, the 144.14.620 is inclusive of capital. Right. Okay, discussion on that? Seeing none, all in favor? Carried. Opposed? That carries. Thank okay. you. And, and uh, just one other matter. There was a, a statement made earlier that area rating actually increased the former city of Hamilton's uh, tax levy. In fact, there was no change to our tax levy. If you recall, Mr. Chairman, Absolutely. the motion that we supported was one in which there was a phased-in approach in the suburbs. The increased dollars that would be um, gathered from that phased approach would be reinvested into capital reserves. So there's a 0% change on the city of Hamilton's, uh, the former city of Hamilton's uh, tax During levy. During the area rating discussion. From the area rating resolution. discussion, correct. Okay, and we'll move on now to Councillor Marula. This is the second time. Um, the first item I was going to speak about was to correct the inaccuracy of the, pre the previous speaker surrounding area rating, uh, but that's been dealt with. Um, secondly, I need to emphasize that, um, as Councillor Duvall has as well, and as I did earlier, that the Hamilton Police Services Association that represents a thousand members supports the motion before us. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Clark. Councillor McCaddy. 
Why we're doing this? This is nice and short. Councillor Councillor Whitehead. Wow. Okay. So you have a motion that's been amended that's before you. Does anybody need to have it reread, or has everybody got it in front of them and understand it? Nobody. Nobody needs it reread. It's been a request for a standing recorded vote. All in favor of the motion, as amended. I'll call them out there. Councillor Pearson, Councillor Powers, Councillor Powers, Councillor McCaddy, Councillor Farr, Morelli, Marula, Hollins, Jackson, Duvall, Whitehead. And Ferguson. Those opposed, please stand. Here, Councillor Clark, Councillor Johnson, Councillor Partridge, and Mayor Bertina. Believe Madam Chair, that carries. Okay, so I'm going to suggest now that we take a break until we still got a lot of agenda items to get through until 22 um, 1. That's a half an hour then. 20 to 2. Thank you.